Okay, so it is 7.33 p.m. on Tuesday, February 13th, 2024. Good evening. My name is Christian Klein. I am the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I am calling this meeting of the board to order. First, I'd like to confirm all members and anticipated officials are present. Uh, from the Board of Appeals, Roger DuPont. Here. Patrick Hanlon. Here. Uh, Venkat Hulley. Here. Uh, Elaine Hoffman. Here. And Adam LeBlanc. Here. And Daniel Riccadelli has a conflict, but he'll be joining us later this evening uh, when he is available. Uh, joining us officials from the town, we have Colleen Ralston, our zoning assistant. Here. Good to have you with us. And we have Michael Cunningham, town council. Here. Thank you for being here. Uh, then appearing for docket 3779, 9 Morton Road, uh, Kate and Anthony Gregorio. Here. Good to see you. Uh, appearing for docket 3782, 53 Lansdowne Road, we have Rebecca and Timothy Center. Here. Good to have you with us. Uh, appearing for docket 3778, 11 Ronald Road, uh, Catherine Alexander. She submitted a letter, so I do not believe she's in attendance this evening. And appearing on for docket 3781, 165 Franklin Street, uh, if Kristen Germano or Gregory Salonaskis? Yeah. Here. Great. Thank you for joining us. So this open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely, consistent with an act making appropriations for the fiscal year 2023 to provide for supplementing certain existing appropriations and for certain other activities and projects signed into law on March 29th, 2023. This act includes an extension until March 31st, 2025, of the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law which suspended the requirement to hold all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Public bodies may continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the public body physically present at a meeting location, so long as they provide adequate alternative access to remote meetings. Public bodies may meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period during each public hearing. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom application with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted to the town's website, identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it will be broadcast by ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference. Others are participating by computer audio or by telephone. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you, your screen name, or another identifier. Please take care to not share personal information. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We ask you to please maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website, unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. And as chair, I reserve the right to take items out of order in the interest of promoting an orderly meeting. As the board will be taking up new business at this meeting, as chair, I make the following land acknowledgement. Whereas the Zoning Board of Appeals for the Town of Arlington, Massachusetts discusses and arbitrates the use of land in Arlington, formerly known as monotomy, an Algonquin word meaning swift waters, the board hereby acknowledges the Town of Arlington is located on the ancestral lands of the Massachusetts tribe, the tribe of indigenous peoples from whom the colony, province, and commonwealth have taken their names. We pay our respects to the ancestral bloodline of the Massachusetts tribe and their descendants who still inhabit historic Massachusetts territories today. So moving to our agenda, um, items two through six are administrative, and I will be shifting those to the end uh, so we can move directly to public hearings. And uh, tonight's public hearings will be heard in the following order. Uh, first, we'll do 3779, 9 Morton Road, then 3778, 11 Ronald Road, then 3782, 53 Lansdowne Road, which is a continuance, and then 3781, 165 Franklin Street. So before opening the, for, the meeting for public hearings, here are some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of tonight's business. After I announce each agenda item, I will ask the applicant to introduce himself or themselves and make their presentation to the board. I'll then request that members of the board ask what questions they have on the proposal. After the board's questions have been answered, I will open the meeting for public comment. At the conclusion of public comment, the board will deliberate and vote on the matter. Any vote taken at this hearing will be preliminary until the written decision is approved by the board at a subsequent meeting. All votes will be conducted by roll call vote. 
Under state law, no decision granted by this board shall take effect until a certified copy of the final decision has been filed with and recorded at the Middlesex South Registry of Deeds in Cambridge by the applicant. So with that, I will uh, open the hearing, or should I should say reopen the hearing for docket 3779, uh, 9 Morton Road. Um, so this, we continued this at the end of last hearing because there were some questions for the applicant in regards to um, the what they were proposing for an accessory structure, uh, accessory dwelling unit at the rear of their property. And so if they could uh, address the board and let us know where they stand today. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you again. Um, I'm Kate Gregorio and my husband. Anthony, great to see you. Thank you for the time. Um, we at this point um, would just like to ask for continuance. We are um, sort of going a little bit back to the drawing board on our end, given all of the feedback and the considerations um, we now have a full picture of. Um, and so we will look to be in communication with Colleen about the plans as they develop. We are going to um, start working with a general contractor to, de to develop some um, blueprints and we'll be able to bring those to the board with us um, next time we see you. Okay. Um, so we're happy to continue. Uh, we do need to continue to a specific date. So I wasn't sure if you had a sense as to how much time you would be looking for. Um, maybe not the next meeting, but the one after that would be a good enough time for us to sort of get things going. So March 12th would be a month from now. That would be great. Okay. Are there any questions from the board? And with that, I would <clears throat> accept a motion to continue the hearing for 9 Morton Road to Tuesday. March 12th, 2024 at 7.30 p.m. Mr. Chairman, so moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. A second? Second. Thank you, Mr. LeBlanc. So this is a vote of the board to continue the hearing for Nine Morton Road to Tuesday, March 12th, 2024 at 7.30 p.m. Uh, Roger DuPont? I'm not hearing this, Mr. Chairman, uh, this particular uh, item. Oh, I beg your pardon. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> I forgot that you were not present at the at the prior hearing. Thank you. Uh Patrick Hanlon. Uh yes. I uh Venkat Hogan. Aye. Um Riccadelli is not here. Uh Elaine Hoffman. Aye. Uh Adam LeBlanc. Aye. And the chair votes aye. So we are continued on Nine Morton Road until Tuesday, March 12th, 2024. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thank, Thank you. you. With that, we've moved to the next item we're taking up on the agenda, which is uh, docket 37781111 3, Ronald Road. Uh, so there is a letter in the uh, in Novus uh, posted to the town in regards to this application. Um, upon further review of the application between the town and the applicant, it has been determined that a special permit is not required for the work that they are proposing to do. Um, and therefore, uh, they do not need relief from this board. And so they have requested that their application be withdrawn. Um, unfortunately, the request was, it was, the determination was made within 48 hours of our hearing. So it was not able to be just withdrawn administratively. So the board does need to vote. Um, so the chair would accept a motion to withdraw the variance request for 9 Morton Road. I mean, excuse me, excuse me, 11. Uh, um, that, 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 that Ronald Road. Uh, Christian. Yes. Um, I'm one of the neighbors. Oh, um, yes. To Catherine, and uh, oh. there was there was no specifics as to what the variance or what she is exactly um applying for. Could you give me some clarification? Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, so the the applicant at 11 Ronald Road, um, they had done a bunch of landscaping at the front. They currently have a set of stairs leading up to an entrance at the first floor. They're proposing to remove that structure and replace it with um, a, a deck at the level of their first floor at the front of the house. Um, the deck does not extend more than 10 feet from the foundation line and it is not covered. And therefore, um, 
under the zoning bylaws, it does not require a special permit. It can be built by right. And so that is what they're going to be constructing. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you for asking the question. Um, so again, so this is a, uh, the chair would accept a motion to accept the withdrawal of the special permit request for 11 Ronald Road. Mr. Chairman, so moved. Thank you, Mr. Hamlin. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Uh, so vote of the board. Um, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hamlin. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. Mr. Riccadelli is not present. Ms. Hoffman. Aye. Mr. LeBlanc. Aye. And the chair votes aye. So the uh, special permit request for 11 Ronald Road has been withdrawn. Okay, so that brings us to uh, docket 3782, 53 Lansdowne Road. Uh, There's a continuance of a prior hearing, uh, which we heard at our January 23rd um, meeting. And so with that, I would um, ask the applicants to reintroduce themselves and um, tell us where we are today. Hey, uh, good evening, Mr. Chair. Uh, can everybody hear me fine? We can. Great, thank you. Uh, my name is Bill Nolan uh, from Savoy Nolan Architects. Uh, I'm here representing uh, Becca and Tim Center, the owners of the property. Uh, also with us today, we have David uh, Crispin, who is our land surveyor and civil engineer, and Russ Busa is our contractor. Uh, so we received, uh, so I just wanted to inform the board that we have um, uh, change directions with regards to our um, our hardship and um, um, Becca has a uh, prepared a presentation um, for you which which she will do uh, but we also wanted to uh, address uh, a comment that was sent to us by Colleen uh, in the interim between the last meeting and this meeting um, regarding the um, status of the lots whether they are uh, separate together um, so uh, 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 Dave uh, Crispin sent a letter uh, to to Colleen. I I sent it um, to her to her email uh, and not through the portal. Uh, so I think she got it late, but she did end up getting it yesterday. Uh, hopefully that was passed on to you guys. Uh, but Dave Dave's here to kind of explain uh, in a little bit more detail. Uh, and I think Becca actually has some information uh, as well. She spoke with her. Um, real estate attorney. So, uh, Dave, if you're here, um, you want to address the uh, the lot issue, please. I am here. <laughs> and just just for the record, that uh, the letter was received and it was posted to Novus, so it is available online. Great, thank you. All right. Um, good evening. I, I I don't want to take a lot of your time up with this. Um, I've been doing this for a long time, and I believe the board would be more than familiar with the merger doctrine. Uh, this is pretty well documented, and basically what that says is if a lot has 5,000 square feet and 50 feet of frontage, if it's located in a single resident zone, and if it was created conforming to zoning at the time, all those questions are yes, and if it was not, if it was, uh, if it was not separately held, uh, in this case, we have two lots, two parcels side by side that have been in common ownership for 78 years. Um, the house was built in 40, and in fact, the house that's standing there now is about four feet onto one of the second parcels. So in my mind, these lots of parcels are clearly one lot for zoning purposes uh, and should be treated as such. And that's basically what my letter said. Uh, just another comment, because assessor's maps are commonly misunderstood with this. Assessor's maps are only intended for assessment purposes only. Um, we can talk about this a little more if you like, but that's that's my story. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, are there any questions from the board specifically in relation to that letter? Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, I just wondered if what Mr. Busa has to say about the zoning bylaws definition of a lot because uh, at least one of the cases that is cited by the uh, DHCD memorandum that is summarized at length in in his letter uh, emphasizes that the general rule is that you don't look at the title unless 
and and the the official way in which this is put into the record books, unless the zoning ordinance or the zoning bylaw uh, so requires. Um, and in that particular case, they went into the whole issue depended upon an interpretation of the local bylaw. Um, our bylaw says a lot is an area or parcel of land or any part thereof, not including water area, in common ownership, does designated on a plan filed with the inspector of buildings by its owner or owners as a separate lot, and having boundaries identical with those recorded in the Middlesex County Registry of Deeds. And that's a little bit murky. It's not quite like saying the lot is exactly what is treated as one lot in the Registry of Deeds, um, but it's not the very general language that is in the um, that is is in the in section 40a uh, and as I say some of the cases seem to indicate that the language of the local bylaw is important and I wonder if Mr. Busa has uh, a view uh, on how it is that we should be interpreting uh, the town's bylaw. I, Mr. Crispin speaking again. I'm um, sorry I made a mistake. That's okay. <laughs> um, I really don't see any difference between what you just read and what the state uh, law says. And the key word there is common ownership. This parcel has been in common ownership for 78 years. The building is on both of the lots at the same time. For zoning purposes, this is one lot. I guess, Mike, what I'd like you to address is the language having boundaries identical with those recorded in the Middlesex County Registry of Deeds. This that this has exactly that. This is registered land, actually. <laughs> um, the, these parcels are uh, exactly, precisely as recorded on registry, and those two parcels comprise one lot. I see. So you're basically your interpretation is that there's no deviation. The the fact that they're the boundaries are what they are, and the treating them as one lot as opposed to two doesn't have anything to do with. Uh, the language about the boundaries being identical because there's no deviation. It's just that you're amalgamating them. Is that basically right? That, that's just one way of putting it, I guess. Yeah. Okay. That was, uh, sorry, just to speak, this is Becca Center, mm -hmm. homeowner. Uh, oh, I also did some mm -hmm. research on this. I talked to the real estate attorney who helped us close on the property originally. And his interpretation is that even though they're listed as two parcels, we have one deed and there's nothing legally that there, we would even need to do to officially combine them because they are already as such. Um, and then I also talked to the tax assessor uh, in Arlington and their opinion was um, that they're, they're one lot and we have two real estate bills because they're two parcels, but we could very easily combine them with a simple letter asking the town to do so um, and, and are happy to do so. But it, it there was nothing that indicated that they were two different lots. And the, the two bills is not uncommon. Yeah. No. Anything further, Mr. Hanlon? No, I, I guess I'm feeling, I feel a little better from what <clears throat> Ms. Center said, because anything that is simply a matter of their going through a formality in order to create something that is exactly what is required seems to me to be close enough to take this issue out of the out of the the case and get us on to what a to what qualifies for a uh, variance. So I'm okay with this. Okay. Are there any questions from any of the other board members at this stage? If not, okay, so then this returns us back to um, with the initial question, uh, which is that this is a request for a variance um, because the applicant is requesting that the uh, proposed structure extend into the front setback, uh, which it would not otherwise be allowed to do. Um, and this is an issue because this is a, the in, existing home is intended to be completely um removed and a new structure created in its place so this is being treated as a new structure rather than as a renovation correct yes okay um, so with that uh i think becca has present uh prepared a uh, presentation for you guys um so i'll hand it over to her okay um, colleen can you go ahead and give her permission to share
Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, excellent. Um, so thank you all for the opportunity to continue this discussion. We definitely took uh, the key points from our previous discussion to heart and had some internal discussions in the interim time between last meeting and this meeting um, and are here to present what hopefully is a bit clearer of uh, definition for why we are requesting a variance to our front setback um, at 53 Lansdowne Road. And please stop me if you have any questions as we uh, move through this. Um, and so I thought maybe I would start by just giving you a bird's eye view of what we what our property is like uh, on Lansdowne Road, because I think a lot of that goes into why we are, in fact, having this discussion today. Um, and so our lot at 53 Lansdowne Road um, is 110 feet uh, long by 64 feet deep. Uh, we are in zoning district R1, where we currently have a single family home, which, as you can see, uh, in this uh, this image here is on uh, the north side of the property. Our current house has a front setback of nine feet and two inches. The south side of the property, which is here, uh, we currently use as our backyard and open space. Our son Luke plays uh, here all the time. Um, and as you can see on Lansdowne Road, which is uh, here in this image here, our lot here is at 53. This um, is consistent with our neighbor who is at 57 Lansdowne Road where we have our houses situated on one side of our property and we use our side yard essentially as our backyard specifically because both of our lots are quite uh, shallow. One of the things that's important to note about Lansdowne Road is that it actually is a relatively steep hill. Uh, and so you drive up the road, uh, up this steep hill, and it begins cresting at the top and terminates in a dead end. The hill crests sort of in line with our neighbor at 57. So we're still significantly on the hill here at 53. Um, this actually creates uh, some unique topography to our particular lot. And so with this image here, which hopefully uh, just demonstrates a bit more now compared to our last conversation, um, the part of the lot, which is the south side over here, um, which we use as our open our open backyard space, actually has uh, a very uh, steep grade. It's a greater than 8% grade, uh, whereas the north side of the property, which is designated with this sort of hash red area here, um, is a much flatter grade, less than 8%. And as you can see, that's where our current house sits. I assume that when it was built back in 1940, that's why it was built where it was, because that's the flat part of the house, uh, flat part of the lot. And so when we were uh, beginning the design process for this new construction home, uh, we also decided that the best place to keep the house would be to keep it on the flat side of the lot, which is located over here. The reasons for that, there are several, obviously, in order to achieve the scope of the house that we are hoping to get by doing this entire process, um, it made sense to keep it on this side. The other thing we considered was because the current house is already situated on this side of the lot, keeping the new house in the same location would minimize construction site work burden because there is already a hole there um, because we have foundation there. Um, and the other thing that was important to us is that by keeping the house on this side of the lot, it would maintain our current neighborhood character and minimize disruption to our neighbors because as we move to put in a new foundation and dig, uh, the current house was already here. And so we're not starting from scratch and digging up an area that literally has never been dug up before. Um, we understand that the zoning bylaws require our front setback to be 25 feet. Um, however, our lot is only 64 feet deep. Um, therefore, if you take into account what we must maintain from a rear setback perspective, this gives us only 26.1 feet of usable depth for a new house, which is not very much. Um, if we were required to do that, as you can imagine, the front setback being much further back than we're currently planning and accounting for a rear setback, um, we would be forced <laughs> to build a very long and narrow house, which would likely take up the vast majority of our open lot. Um, in order to achieve the same square footage. 
So why are we here today? <laughs> the reason we're here today is to request a variance to provide relief for this 25 foot setback regulation, which is set, set forth in, in um, uh, 5.4.2 of the zoning bylaw um, in order to build a new construction house on our existing property. Um, we understand uh, after our conversation from the last meeting that there are three distinct criteria that must be met in order to be granted a variance. Um, and we'll talk through each of these criteria in detail and how we believe that we satisfy these based on our currently designed plan. Um, uh, they obviously, criteria one is it must relate to the soil conditions, the shape or the topography of the land in question. Criteria two is that a literal enforcement of this 25 foot bylaw would involve substantial hardship, um, financial or otherwise. And that criteria three, um, such relief, if granted, uh, should not be without substantial detriment to the public good uh, and without nullify or substantially derogating from the intent or purpose of the bylaw. And so we'll move on to each of these criteria in relation to this particular project. So criteria one, obviously, as you're all familiar, is that we must have a condition for hardship that relates to the soil conditions, the shape, or the topography of such land. Um, I just want to note by bringing up this GIS map of our neighborhood um, that the majority of the houses on Lansdowne Road, so this is Lansdowne here, the majority of the houses on Lansdowne Road are um, deep lots that actually are oriented perpendicular to the road. So they have the narrow portion on facing Lansdowne Road and the vast majority of their land runs deep away from the street. As you can see here, uh, we are unique in that the, the long axis of our particular lot actually runs parallel to the road. Um, and therefore, we are particularly impacted by being held to a 25 foot setback requirement because our uh, lot is long here and very shallow here. Um, despite this than the fact that most of the lots on Lansdowne Road actually are quite deep. Um, there are very few, if any, lots that actually have a, a setback that is 25 feet. In fact, the vast majority of the properties are much, much closer than that to the road. And so what, we, uh, what we're uh, faced with in our particular situation is not just that our lot is uh, wide and shallow. It's the fact that it's the combination of the fact that our lot is very narrow uh, in terms of depth, but also situated on a hill <laughs> that uh, would require us if we were if we were faced with having to maintain a 25 foot setback would lead us to create this long and narrow house, which would extend a, a much larger portion of the house uh, onto the uh, very sloped region of our, our land, uh, uh, which is greater than 8% sloped. And in fact, the, the bylaws themselves recognize that sloped land greater than 8% is actually difficult topography to make use of. And so we believe that that really is our rationale for satisfying criteria one, is that we're going to have to put a whole portion of this house onto a very steep uh, piece of land uh, if we need to maintain a 25 foot setback on our particularly uh, shallow lot. In terms of criteria two, um, as I said, it's the combination of both the shape and the topography of our lot that results in, that could result in the construction of a very long narrow house on a sloped portion of our land. Um, this would significantly increase the cost of the project. Um, we would, in order to make that happen, we've talked through it as a team, um, significant additional fill would need to be brought on site in order to make the south side of the property, which currently is quite sloped, uh, more level, um, because we need to ensure that the planned basement is not considered a floor, uh, and in order to maintain the garage under the house, which is how it currently is situated and uh, which would be in keeping with the, the design standards. Um, it also should be noted that the current plan that we're proposing, which would leave the house on the north side of the property, actually does not require additional fill to be brought on site. Um, if we did need to make this long, narrow house, uh, retaining walls would need to be built likely along the entire south side of the property, as well as the majority of the road facing side of the property in order to appropriately retain this fill. These would need to be constructed with appropriate reinforcement. 
Um, and uh, as good neighbors, we would not be not want these walls to just be uh, very stark concrete. We'd need to make them uh, look aesthetically pleasing, which would add additional cost by making uh, adding stone facade. Um, the cost difference for this alteration is estimated to be between seventy-five to one hundred thousand dollars above what our current construction estimate is, which we find unduly burdensome and honestly would go well beyond what we're financially able to support for this project. And then third, uh, obviously, um, we believe that the plan we proposed uh, to you actually uses the land in the best way. Um, we're keeping the house in the same location that it currently is, which minimizes changes to the site, does not uh, artificially change drainage, uh, and also it uh, maintains the look of the neighborhood. Uh, it's consistent with Arlington design standards, um, which uh, is that our current, the house that we're proposing would have consistency with the current street elevation. In fact, um, our house would be, the house that we're proposing actually moves it further back um, from the road, which moves it closer in line with our neighbor at 57, um, if it was a 25 foot outlier, a 25 foot setback it actually would be an outlier on the street because no one else is that far. Um, a more condensed footprint, which is what we've designed, actually leaves all this open space and allows for more natural light on the site. Um, and in, in doing so also allows us to keep our garage under the house, uh, which is desirable for off-street parking consideration. Um, we actually, in addition, um, are, at, are improving the existing conditions of the property. Uh, we currently have a non-conforming north side setback, which is uh, only 3.8 feet from the property line closest to our neighbor at 57 Lansdowne Road. Uh, we plan to correct this through the new construction. Additionally, uh, and the point I wanna note uh, strongly is that the plan design actually improves the front setback from its current location. Um, so the current house is nine feet, two inches from the road. The proposed house is 16 feet, six inches from the road with an 11 feet, six inch covered porch. Um, this is very consistent with the rest of the street. Um, and in addition, obviously building a nicer house increases the surrounding property values uh, of our neighbors and uh, the tax base for the town. And so we, this is why we are requesting a variance um, to provide relief for the 25 foot setback uh, regulation set forth in the zoning bylaw uh, for this new construction. This is just a picture of what we're planning to build. You saw this last time. I think we all agreed that this is a, a really nice looking project. Uh, will uh, maintain what the look of the houses in the area are. It maintains open space so that our kids can play in the yard. Um, and we believe that it is consistent uh, with the purpose of the Arlington bylaws. Um, and then it does not negatively take away from the intent of those bylaws. And so the last thing that I would say uh, is we also considered, obviously, uh, I understand uh, that the board uh, does not take lightly to granting variances. I understand that. Um, and so we considered the scenario where uh, you don't feel comfortable granting this variance. And so uh, obviously, as we mentioned, building a long narrow house, which would take up almost all of our open space is not something that we feel comfortable doing. It would be an outlier in the neighborhood and I saw. Um, and so we feel the most logical solution uh, if this variance isn't granted, would be to develop a similar project in the same location, but we'd need to use the existing foundation to do so, um, which we feel is not ideal on several fronts, both for us as the owners, but also um, to the neighborhood and the community. Um, the current house, the existing foundation is concrete block, um, which is not used in today's building practices. Uh, in order to build the house of the scope that we're looking to build, it would require additional reinforcing to support these additional levels. Um, our current basement height is quite low and we need additional structure to bring it into today's standards. As I mentioned, we have a garage which is currently under the house. Uh, it's important for us to retain that uh, so we have off street parking. Um, our current pitch of our driveway, I think we mentioned this during the last meeting, the current pitch in the driveway is quite steep um, and it makes it really difficult to drive into the driveway. And also we have had issues with stormwater entering the house because it slopes uh, very steeply towards the house. Um, and if the slab were, if we were forced to keep the slab height in the same position, it would be hard to fix this. And I should note in our current plan, we actually have uh, 
made a solution, which we described last time, which actually creates uh, almost no slope to our driveway, which would be a huge improvement. Um, and of course, uh, using this existing foundation and the structural support we would need to put into it to maintain the, the house would be uh, more expensive and it would maintain foundation that is uh, outdated. Um, and in terms of the neighborhood and the community impact, if we were to keep the existing footprint of the house, it would maintain this very close north side setback, um, which we are trying to improve because if you remember from the GIS map, we are the closest on that side to our neighbor at 57. Um, and obviously if we were forced to do this as well, uh, the house would be even closer than what we're, we're asking to do now. Uh, and so we really feel like the variance, while I understand not always um, the uh, easiest thing to get granted, actually improves from where we currently are. Um, and so with that, I would just uh, say thank you for letting us uh, share the rationale for this project and, and why we've come to you with the variance. Um, on a personal note, obviously, we're hoping to be able to, to do this project. We spent a lot of time and effort to design it. Um, saved money over every year that we've lived in this house. Um, we have a young son, he just turned five yesterday. Uh, we'd like for him to go to kindergarten at Stratton this year. There are three other little boys who are also five on our dead end street who will also go to Stratton this year. Um, and so we're just trying to do uh, something that suits our family's needs in the long term, but also does not negatively impact our neighbors and the neighborhood. So thank you. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions. Hey, thank you so much for that. Um, could you go back to the first slide? Yep. I think that's the one that has the grades on it. Yeah. Yep. Oh, sorry. One, sorry, the second, the next one, sorry. Yep. Um so, so this is showing the proposed house um in the dark line, and then the red hash is the area that is less than eight percent grade. Yeah. Um I wanted to ask uh Mr. Crispin if there is sufficient land area after the construction of the house to meet the usable open space requirement. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Uh, no, Mr. Nolan, uh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, if I could share my screen, I, I updated the usable um, square footage. The answer is yes. And if I could share my screen, uh, I, I have an updated graphic on that. Tony, if you could go ahead and do that. You are all set, Bill. Great, thank you, Colleen. Uh, share. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I've I've updated that. Um, uh, reviewed the uh, reviewed the um the bylaw again, and um, we can have a we can have a portion of the um usable open space on on a sloped lot, and that's what we have here. It's close. Now, mm -hmm. in reality, this whole yard is used for open space, and and they do use it, but by the definition of the law, uh, we do meet it. A small percentage is um, uh, part of a covered porch, which is allowed. I think 75% has to be open open to above, sky to above. Mm -hmm. And um, a small percentage of the um, uh, open space is on the slope, which is, which is allowed. Again, 75% has to be on there. I did the calculations um, and the math here. Um, it, it checks out. So, we're not before the board asking for any relief on the open um, usable space, and we will need to meet that or we'll be back in front of you asking for relief on that. Uh, but just just to prove to you that we did look at it and um, everything that I see, meet, we meet the definition of it. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to confirm because obviously this plan doesn't have the contour lines on it, so it's difficult to assess. Um, and the, the prior plan has the has the contours, but doesn't have this area marked out. So I'm just trying to sort of get a sense because, you know, as the as the the homeowner said, that, you know, this part of the parcel is sloped to such an extent that it creates a hardship. So yeah. I wanted to confirm that it wasn't so much, you know, it it wasn't so sloped that it was unable to be used as usable open space. Yeah. Um, so it, by the definition of the. Uh... The regulations it's over eight percent that we calculated mm -hmm. um but um where we have enough of it on the flat area that it qualifies for it 
part of, okay. most of it's actually in in a um a patio space that we're we're going to be leveling off a little bit anyways okay um hopefully that answers your question it does it does um and then a, a second question the so the i'm assuming based on the discussion about the garage that the basement level is being raised is that correct yes raised um, and and uh, yeah and it's uh it's actually slightly this is where the hill actually does work in our favor uh, because the garage is sl slightly moving um, down slope. Um, the combination of ra raising the garage a little bit and moving it more down the slope allows us to have a much um, shallower pitch to the house, okay. which and, is easier to, to mitigate the drainage too. Okay. And then in terms of the, the level of the first floor relative to the average grade, um, do you have a dimension on that? I just want to confirm uh, that we're not accidentally making that lowest level of story by raising it. Right. Uh, uh, great catch. Thank you. And, and we're not, um, okay. I think, uh, yeah. So, uh, the existing first floor, um, I'm sorry, the, the basement slab will be less than, um, le less than four, four foot six of it will be exposed. Therefore, okay. it, it won't be classified as a um, as a story. And again, I, I just to reiterate what, what Becca said um, during her presentation, um, that becomes significantly harder to do the further we move down the hill, necessitating excessive fill and mm -hmm. potentially retaining walls. The other thing I'd want to point out, too, is the way that the building department looks at um, at land is it's not it's not the land that touches the, the the face of the wall. It's six feet out. So not only are you, um, you know, filling, you're filling six feet out in order to, to maintain that, um, the elevation that we need. So, okay. so it is a significant amount of fill. Okay. Um, and then just a question about the nature of the ground there. So is it primarily ledge or is it, loose or what what is sort of the nature of the the ground there dave that that's a mr crispin question <laughs> we have, we actually did do some test pits out there and it is a uh, a silty gravel uh, to a depth of about 10 feet so we're in good shape okay we are pro pro proposing a um a catch basin on site too to handle all the storm flow um that the house and, and and current property will so that's another another uh, i think benefit to the, the to the neighborhood is that where we now we now will have control over all storm water on the site and those were the structures that were on the the plan um that the center had correct yeah yes okay right. Uh, questions from other members of the board? Mr. Hanlon? First of all, I'd like to congratulate Ms. Center on her presentation and request that she that that uh, the applicant submit the uh, submit the PowerPoint presentation uh, to us so that we can follow and and ultimately when an opinion is written to take fully into consideration all the things she said um and i hope that would be okay um the question i have we've we've sort of have got a you've got the this house there's a possibility that you'd have to make something completely uh meet the bylaw and the difficulties of doing that Ms. Center described. Uh, and another possibility is just to stick to the same foundation and the disadvantages of that uh, have been described. Um, but this is a 4,500 square foot house, which is a pretty good size. And there's nothing in the zoning bylaw that says that, that you have to be able to achieve the full you know, extent of what you'd like in order to uh, avoid having a hardship. Um, and I wonder whether what would happen, how, if you, if you were going to re to re renovate in the sense that you're building a new structure, 
you can't build 4,500 square feet in a sensible way because that um, uh, because that has all the disadvantages that have been described. Where is it that you get to the point where you could build it? You, it obviously would be a hardship because it would be considerably less valuable than what you're proposing to do. Um, but, you know, could you do 3,500 square feet, 3,000 square feet? Uh, essentially nothing more than you you're currently doing where does it sort of switch where it's not pra where suddenly it's it's practical even if it's less than fully desirable to uh, to build something something new I get that this design wouldn't work in that way but uh I just sort of like the record to sort of deal with that possibility that you just built a somewhat smaller house it's a fair question uh, and I'll be honest and say that my husband and I spent uh, more time than our design team would like thinking about the size of the house. Um, for me, it really comes down to uh, the footprint of where we've landed um, is I, I am not sure if we could get to a smaller square footage by decreasing the footprint of the house, because I think that the orientation of how we have designed at least the first floor in particular um, to have an open living space uh, between the kitchen and the living room uh, such that they're positioned on the side of the property where the sunlight is best. Um, I don't think there's a, a way for us to reduce the footprint of the house uh, and achieve the, the something that we would want to build, if that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, and I think the um, living space, I believe, is closer to 3,400 square feet, was my understanding, actually. Um, are you counting the basement with that? I'm just, I was just relying on the uh, number in your application for gross square footage. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Gross, gross square footage takes into a little bit more into um than than complete living space. It, you have to include the um the basement spaces and um I believe garage too. The uh the only thing that you don't include is mechanical spaces, if I if I remember it correctly. The uh I will say that that is one of the more complex um uh formulas to, to, to generate um, <laughs> space. So, so if I'm, if I'm misstating it, uh, I apologize. Uh, living, living, finished living area though, we're about 3,500 square feet, um, um, which is, you know, again, in keeping with the majority of the houses in, in that neighborhood. Uh, there's also a certain price point um, you know, I don't know if we need to get into or want to get into the economics of the the property too. But Arlington is a um, you know, it's a sought after place to live, and and these properties and houses sold a certain value. This, I believe, is in keeping with what is you know consistent in that in that neck of the woods, so to speak. Thank you. Further questions from the board. Seeing none, um, <clears throat> we can go ahead and leave the plan up on the screen that's up there now. Um, but <clears throat> so before I open the, uh, uh, I'm now going to be opening the meeting for public comment. So public questions and comments are taken as they relate to the matter at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing its decision. Members of the public will be granted time to ask questions and make comments. Members of the public who wish to speak should digitally raise their hand using the button on the reactions tab in the Zoom application. Those calling in by phone, please dial star nine to indicate you would like to speak. You'll be called upon by the chair. You'll be asked to give your name and address. You'll be given time for your questions and comments. All questions are to be addressed through the chair. Please remember to speak clearly. For anyone wishing to address the board a second time during any particular hearing, the chair will allow those wishing to speak for the first time to be called upon first. 
once all public questions and comments have been addressed or an allocated time has ended, the public comment period will be closed. So now that it is 8.23 p.m., uh, I will open public comment until 9 p.m. Um, so with that, are there any members of the public who wish to address this application? I see one hand, Mr. Moore. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. I'm glad uh, Mr. Hanlon raised that, that issue about uh, house size because the hardship of cost uh, of doing something different than this design is um, the hardship is created by the um, the size of the it's a self created hardship um, uh, because of the size of the proposed house um, that the cost of doing it differently into the other lot that's part of this parcel as well um, is more expensive. Uh, I, I I guess I have a question uh, about the uh, um, and I don't know. I assume that the um, the applicants can answer it. These were two parcels that have been combined by uh, a single owner of two parcels. Um, the tax bills that have been run on these houses all these years, or this house and the other lot all these years. I'm I guess I would ask if the tax rate was the same on both parcels? Um, if the applicant has, can address that question? I have no idea, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Never quite paid attention to that. Uh, it's, a, it's a fair question. Uh, I, I don't know the answer. Well, I imagine that it's not. I imagine that the one that the vast majority of the house is on might be higher. It's possible that the land value is similar between the two, but obviously the property value would be very different between the two. But I don't know. Right, Mr. Chair, I ask about the tax rate as opposed to the tax bill. Mm -hmm. um, the tax rate uh, on uh, the land, uh, I'm just wondering if the tax rate on the land was the same for both. And the reason being that uh, many years of, let's say it was a lower tax rate on the undeveloped property, um, there's been a benefit retained by the owner all those years of a lower tax rate. Now, that's just an assumption. I don't know that the tax rate is lower. Um, and the, by not combining the properties, there was, if that is true, there was a lower rate on the undeveloped land that that was a benefit accrued to the owner for many, 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 many years, uh, various owners, including the current owners. And uh now the idea that uh the t the the property is treated as a combined set of properties uh sort of solidifies now that or makes that makes that benefit uh permanent um I, I guess i'm not saying this very clearly um my big concern is that it looks from aerial uh aerial views that there's uh some significant uh, trees on this undeveloped property that may be retained or may not. And so I would ask the question through you, Mr. Chair, uh, what is the plan for the trees on the what is now an undeveloped piece of property, as well as the trees on the other one? I think this mir mirrors the issue I might have raised at the last meeting with a similar sort of question. Um, the two lots would have setbacks allied to both of them. The single lot would have setbacks allied to a combined that would be different, perhaps, for the retention of the trees. And I'm wondering what the plan generally is for the trees on the property, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Um, but as the applicants, do you have a site plan that shows the location of trees and the disposition of those trees? Uh, uh, no, I don't believe that we we documented the trees. Um, if, if you don't mind, I can answer this back up. Um, sure. So if if the uh, if we're allowed to move forward with the proposal, um, we will speak with the tree warden and make sure that we you know work with the um, with the town with regards to this. There are some very mature trees that are very close to both houses. Um, I think uh, I think, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Becca and Tim. Um, I think 
um, both neighbors uh, would like to see the, the large trees removed because they're somewhat dangerous. And uh, the intent would be to replace them with new um, um, with new trees that are, you know, healthier. Yeah, and I can add, you know, the, those trees in question are, I think they were brought here from Canada by the people who originally bought the property 50 years ago. I think three years ago in a big nor'easter, one of them was blown over and nearly took out our neighbor's house. So, um, yeah, just to speak to the hazard of those. They're not native. Yeah, and and uh, so I I recognize uh, Mr. Moore's concern of the trees. Uh, we also uh, are avid naturists and want to make sure that we maintain uh, the the trees on the property. As Tim mentioned, uh, yeah, these trees are really tall and they scare the heck out of all of our neighbors uh, as they're easily hundreds of feet tall. Uh, and as he mentioned, one fell one time, which was terrifying. Uh, so the plan has been to remove those very, very tall, dangerous trees that line the property line and replace them with something that is equally as beautiful, but also uh, safer. And that has uh, actually been fully supported by every single one of our neighbors that we've talked to. No other trees though, are, are planned to be removed or um, other than the, the tall ones and they will be replaced. And we will do this in accordance with the uh, with the Arlington regs. Great. Thank you for that. Mr. Moore? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, I, I understand that, that tall trees can represent a danger. Um, usually that occurs because the trees haven't been maintained. Trees need to be maintained like any other plant, and that means trimmed of their dangerous aspects as they grow. I will remind the applicant that the tall trees have a much larger impact on reducing global warming than small trees that replace them. It takes 35 years for a small tree to go grow enough to perform the uh, valuable service that the current large tree is is providing uh, with proper care that large tree can be made safe. Um, I don't uh, my my whole uh, diatribe about uh, that you know the two lots and tax rates and things like that was aimed towards the fact that setbacks of two lots are different than the setbacks of a combined lot, and I'm worried about the implications for these trees or the tree, the large tree in particular and how removing it and replacing it with smaller trees will not allow the community to have performed the same task that the current large tree performs. I understand that a lot of folks fear large trees because of the very thing that happened to one of them, which was it fell over and could easily have caused significant property damage. But I also again remind the applicant that proper maintenance of trees minimizes that risk and the community benefit which may not accrue directly to the owner is lost if they are taken. Thank you. And, and that's the very same thing that the, um, the tree warden will relate to you when you speak with them uh, and develop your tree plan. Again, I would encourage the applicant to retain the large tree, not take it down. Thank you, Mr. Chip. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Are there other members of the public who wish to address this hearing? I do not currently see any other names or any hands raised. Again, it's the on the reactions tab. There's a raise hand button if you wish to address this. I don't see anyone either waving their hands in a window, so I will assume that no one else wishes to address this hearing. So I will go ahead and close public comment uh, for this hearing. Um, so then that brings the question back to the board. So what is requested of the board is a variance. Um, uh, on this property, um, in regards to the front yard setback, um, I believe that is the only variance that is required uh, for this property to move forward. Um, the existing house is non-conforming on the lot uh, in regards to both the front yard setback and in regards to the side yard setback. Um, and as the, as the applicant had noted, um, 
a project like this could have gone forward as a renovation, uh, which would have uh, imposed certain restrictions to um, uh, reuse of the existing house and how that might have impacted the project, um, but it would allow them to take advantage and maintain the existing um, non-conformities in regards to the side yard setback and the front yard setback. However, they are requesting of the board a variance to allow them essentially to reduce the, the existing setbacks um, that they have in regards to the front yard and the side yard um, in order to uh, construct a house of the depth that they feel is, a, is appropriate to their needs. Um, so with that, I would, the, the board has before the question of a variance. So we, ha we do have the standard for um, criteria that are required of a variance. Um, and so I would just uh, at the start uh, turn to the board and see if there are any further um, questions they would want to ask of the applicant or the applicant's consultants in regards to uh, the property or what is being proposed. Seeing none. Um, <clears throat> so then the question before the board, the board would need um, under state law and under town law, the board needs to make uh, a series of findings that in regards to a variance, those findings build upon each other um, so that if any of the uh, particular findings cannot be made, um, then a variance cannot be granted under state law. Um, so the first finding that the board would be required to make is uh, that there is a circumstance relating to soil condition, shape, or topography, especially affecting such land or structures, but not affecting generally the zoning district in which it is located that would substantiate the granting of a variance. Uh, so essentially, is there something about the soil shape or topography of the site that specifically that is particular to this site and not a general condition in the underlying district that would um, substantiate the need for a variance? And to um, and as the the applicant has stated, and I would I would ask her to correct me if I have this thing correctly. Um, <clears throat> essentially, they're, the lot that they have is a long, so it's sort of a long, narrow lot, but it is oriented parallel to the street rather than perpendicular to the street, uh, which creates certain conditions for them so that the, the largest setbacks that are required under our bylaws are actually working against the short dimension as opposed to working against the long dimension of their property. And they are looking to comply with the rear yard setback, uh, which necessitates the, their, the front yard setback is not as it would be required for the district. Um, and they have also noted that the setback that they are proposing in the front is more in keeping with what is common for the district. And I would note that we had at the prior hearing, we did have a substantial amount of conversation about uh, the town does have in its bylaws five three section five three ten which al allows for setting the setback of a property relative to the abutting to the basically the average of the other properties that are developed on that block and this is kind of a, a quirky situation because there are only two houses on the block and so um if you remove the one house, the house that remains is no longer more than 50% of the block. And so that is not something that's available to them, um, but it does indicate uh, a willingness on, in the town bylaws that maintaining a level street front is something that the, the town has contemplated and has felt is something that might be appropriate. Um, but the question is really is whether the the shape of the of the lot and the topography of the lot would justify um, 
the granting of a variance because I think we have the conversation with um, with the soils expert that they had done test pits and it is basically loose gravel. So there is nothing particular about uh, the soil conditions that would make it difficult to comply with the bylaw. So it really comes down to shape and uh, the topography of the site. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Chair. Oh, uh, sorry, I, I heard Mr. Hanlon. Who's the other? Was that Mr. Nolan? Was it? The yeah, other? sorry. I, I just wanted to add one thing: is the um, the perpendicular um, to the, or the parallel with the street is also the hill. So, and I, mm -hmm. I think that's that's the um, that's the critical part here is that um, by being parallel with the street, we're also parallel with the hill. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hanlon. So, Mr. Chairman, under the <clears throat> way the state law has written the requirement for soil slope or topography uh, is that the hardship has to has to arise from that. Um, it's not as if we evaluate separately slope and shape uh, in order to decide whether or not a variance is required. We just have to make sure that the hardship that's being claimed is coming from a relatively unusual situation that relates to the uh, shape and topography. Um, and if you look at what the hardship is that the applicant are claiming, we may or may not agree that that is a sufficient hardship uh, to warrant a variance, but it is flowing from the shape and topography. Uh, this is clearly a very shallow lot. Uh, dealing with that in some way uh, is clearly something that the topography makes more difficult. Um, the so that then will bring us to the question of whether there is, and and I guess the other thing is that it's not it's not as if every lot in this on this street has this problem. Uh, I, generally, they don't have this problem. Uh, it's probably not true that throughout Arlington there must be other places that have shallow lots. And there certainly are places that are on steep hill. It's the combination and and taking a certain degree of local view of what the comparison is. At least in this particular area, uh, this is an unusual situation that prevents the applicant from doing some things that uh, are being done by the other properties in the area. And later we we'll, we would presumably get to the question about. Uh, the impact on the neighborhood and, and whether something is consistent with the bylaw and we can hold that analysis. But it does seem to me that that if this isn't absolutely unique, it's it's not the Mona Lisa. It may not even be an Andy Warhol, which is hardly unique at all. Um, but it seems to me to be enough to get us to criteria number two. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Other comments from the board? Seeing none, unless there's any objections from the board, we'll move on to criteria two. So criteria two is that the literal enforcement of the provisions of the zoning bylaw, specifically relating to the circumstances affecting the land or structure noted above, would involve substantial hardship, financial or otherwise, to the petitioner or appellant. Um, <clears throat> so literal enforcement would mean that they do have to uh, maintain that 25 foot setback um, where they're now proposing, I believe it's 16.6 feet. Uh, and as the, the appellant had said earlier, that would limit their house to 26 feet in depth, um, which is unusually shallow for a house. Um, granted the the length of the lot um, is perpendicular to, you know, it, would be, it, it could be very long, um, but it does sort of, create an odd situation where effectively you would have that side of the house facing the street rather than the 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 front. Um, and so um, so I guess the question of the literal enforcement um, would it create a substantial hardship to the to the appellant? Um, Sort of the question, the question that the board needs to needs to address. Okay, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon? I, I sort of began that. So I thought, in my view, the answer is yes. 
Um, and let's take it in three different ways. One is, let's suppose that the applicant were to say, okay, um, we'll observe it. I, th I think that the house that would emerge is a significantly less desirable house. Uh, just objectively, it's, it's a less desirable house. Uh, the long, narrow thing makes it even, even if it's feasible to do that, uh, that that would be a, a significant harm. Um, but of course, it's true that the zoning bylaw doesn't guarantee you everything you want. So it's important to look at the alternatives to see what, to see just to what degree this is a matter of sort of unreasonable ambitions rather than a matter of real hardship. I think that trying to do it over on the on the uh, uh, on the existing foundation uh, would be a substantial hardship and would be extremely negative for the community as well. Uh, preserving the existing foundation would be a real problem. Uh, it's environmentally quite unsound to do that, and the uh, and it would ultimately produce. If it's feasible at all, it would produce a house that's very, very different from what the uh, the applicant is is looking to do. Um, so then there's the intermediate. So it just in general, I'm persuaded by what Ms. Center said about that. I don't want to go into it in great detail, but I thought her presentation was persuasive. So the middle thing is, let's suppose you have a somewhat smaller house. Uh, at what point can you have something that's full, full that's reasonably satisfactory? Um, but that doesn't involve the kinds of problems that we've been talking. And it's a little vague on this, and I think that people can come to different views on it. Um, but I do think that that trying to sort of just make you take the the half a loaf approach uh, rather than being like Goldilocks, it might be a little bit like splitting the baby. Uh, it's not really going to address the kind of hardship that is that is involved here. Obviously, there is a house that's small enough that you can fit it on here, uh, but you have to sort of have a general sense of what's reasonable. Um, certainly, making this the Taj Mahal is not reasonable, but this is an area that has a certain character to it. Uh, and actually, the thing that the proposal that the applicant has that is most consistent with what is existing in the area is the proposal that they're making to us for which they need a a variant. So I, I think that the half a loaf is really not better uh, at this point and that uh, the difficulty is I feel for their predicament and believe that uh, the, the house, the 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 alternatives that that we've discussed uh, are not really sufficient to make this uh, simply something you have to get along with, as opposed to something that that is the kind of harm that uh, that it, the zoning bylaw deals with. I will say that in other cases, we found that it's just a hard hardship not not to be able to build a driveway on your property. It's not as if the kind of hardship that is involved here that is involved in a variance it has to be uh, to some extent it involves a significant interference with your ability to do what you otherwise have a right to do under the law it's very unclear but i think that that i don't really think this is that close to the edge i think that there is a hardship here thank you mr hanlon other comment from the board in regards to the second criteria Seeing none, um, unless there's an objection, I'll move on to the third criteria, um, which is how the desirable relief may be granted without substantial detriment to the public good. Um, I think the, the construction of the house um, as it is being proposed, where uh, although it is not as far from the, the street as would be uh, required for a new permit, uh, where it is deeper than it currently is, and it appears to be more in keeping with the adjacent house to it, um, and in keeping with the, and more generally the pattern of the street, um, that this does is not any form of detriment to the public good. Um, should this, uh, should the relief be granted? Any other comments on the in regards to criteria three?
Mr. Chair. Mr. LeBlanc. Uh, I guess on this point, just also wanted to add that um, with this current design and going with a new construction house here, that it actually does benefit not only the neighborhood, but the town itself as it will be much more energy efficient and built in a much more sustainable way than the current building that is there, the current house that is there. So it will be improving the neighborhood um, in, through that as well, not just, you know, it being a new structure, but it being a, an energy efficient one that will help improve that as well. Thank you, Mr. LeBlanc. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. I both agree with what Mr. LeBlanc said, and but would like to address what Mr. Moore has been talking about. The question of the, there will be required a tree plant anyway, as Mr. Nolan pointed out. Uh, and there'll be a discussion that will parallel the kind of discussion we had here uh, today. Um, and uh, it, it seems to me that that probably the tree warden can deal with that in an effective way if the applicant is being cooperative about doing that. But I would I encourage the applicant to to take very seriously what Mr. Moore said and what the tree warden says in designing a tree preservation uh, uh, plan on this site. Um, it's it that is certainly a part of the the impact uh, that this has on the public and it's not necessarily a simple uh, issue but it's something that that needs to be done with be with the town's expert and that it will be done in ordinary course thank you mr hanlon unless there's any objection from the board i'll move on to criteria four so criteria four is that desirable relief may be granted without nullifying or substantially derogating from the intent or purpose of the zoning bylaw. Um, so should the board grant um, grant relief, we will be exchanging a one family house for a new, larger, more energy efficient one family house. Um, it will be sitting in approximately the same location. It will be um, it will extend slightly deeper into the site, but not past any uh, setbacks. Um, and it will leave a substantial portion of the yard open uh, for the enjoyment of the owners, but also providing open, open space and open air for uh, the properties that do abut um, that portion of the property. And um, Certainly the construction along those lines would not nullify or substantially derogate from the intent or purpose of the zoning bylaw, which is, you know, the the, the careful development of land, the improvement of in quality in the of the land, improvement of the value of the town, um, while the maintaining uh some of the natural aspects, uh access to air, access to light, um and uh, sort of preservation of the the character of the town, and I think that the, should the board grant this uh, this variance application, it would not derogate from any of those intents. Um, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Hanlon, I I agree with that. I I just add one thing, and that this is a situation where if we step back from the language of Section Five Three Ten, uh, and we look to sort of at what the urban planning aspect of all of this is. This is a neighborhood where actually keeping and observing the 25 feet is likely to be somewhat out of, certainly if you look across the street, it is some, It would be somewhat out of character with what is, is the established pattern there. And if the purpose of the bylaw is to figure, is to provide for harmony in the way the streets are laid out and and we're free to talk look at both sides of the street instead of what we have to do for just the literal application of the bylaw it seems to me that the underlying policy of of land use here is is well situated by something that provides for more setback than there is today but not as much as the full setback that that uh uh, would be required by by the bylaw. So, you know, in some ways, as is true of much of this case, in some ways, granting the variance is more in the public interest and more consistent with the purpose of the bylaw than denying it would be. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Other comments from the board? Thank 
Seeing none. Um, so the board has a couple of tasks in front of it at this point. Uh, one is to uh, codify a vote on the findings uh, to confirm that we we confirm the vote on the, the four findings. Should the board vote uh, positively on all four findings, uh, then the, we will move on to conditions and whether there are conditions that the board would need to impose in order to, um, uh, to ensure that uh, what the board is looking for uh, in regards to the granting of this application would be carried forward. And then the board would take one final vote um, on the, the variance application, including the conditions. So unless there's anything that needs to occur before that, I was going to go ahead and move to the vote on the findings. Um, so it's been the board's practice um, <clears throat> because of variances, sort of a different sort of animal than our typical, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, special permits that we do vote um, on the four findings to because we do need a positive uh, vote on all four findings. It cannot just be um, on the majority of the findings. So with that, in regards to the first finding, that uh, circumstances relating to soil condition, shape, topography, especially affecting such land or structures, but not affecting generally the zoning district in which it is located, that would substantiate the granting of a variance. Uh, so uh, members of the board voting to affirm um, that finding. And look for that, where's my other sheet? Um, so I would ask for the vote, Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Uh, Mr. Holly? Aye. Uh, Ms. Hoffman? Aye. Mr. LeBlanc? Aye. And the chair votes aye. That is the finding is affirmed. Uh, the second finding, uh, literal enforcement of the provisions of the zoning bylaw, specifically relating to the circumstances affecting the land or structures noted above, would involve substantial hardship, financial or otherwise, to the petitioner or appellant. Uh, so this again requires an affirmative vote of the board uh so with that mr hanlon aye uh mr holly aye ms hoffman aye mr leblanc aye and the chair votes aye that uh, finding is affirmed that brings to the third uh that desirable relief may be granted without substantial detriment to the public good um again an affirmative vote required of the board mr hanlon aye mr holly Aye. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. Mr. LeBlanc? Aye. That is affirmed. That brings us to the fourth and final criteria uh, finding, that desirable relief may be granted without nullifying or substantially derogating from the intent or purpose of the zoning bylaw. Uh, again, an affirmative vote is required. Uh, Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. And Mr. LeBlanc? Aye. That is affirmed. Okay, so the board has found that it can grant a variance in this case. Um, and as I said, that brings us up to conditions. So uh, there are three standard conditions that the board applies to all applications before it. Um, the first is that the plans and specifications approved by the board for this variance shall be the final plans and specifications submitted to the building inspector of the town of Arlington in connection with this application for zoning relief. There shall be no derivation excuse me, there shall be no deviation during construction from the approved plans and specifications without the express written approval of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, number two is the building inspector is hereby notified that they are to monitor the site and should proceed with appropriate enforcement procedures at any time they determine that violations are present. The building inspector shall proceed under section 3.1 of the zoning bylaw and under the provisions of chapter 40, section 21D of the Massachusetts general laws and institute non-criminal complaints. If necessary, the building inspector may also approve and institute appropriate criminal action also in accordance with section 3.1. And standard criteria uh, condition number three is the board shall maintain continuing jurisdiction with respect to this variance grant. Are there other conditions that members of the board feel would be appropriate for this application? Um, I know we have discussed a few times uh, the question about uh, the tree warden. Um, so I would. Uh, put forward that the we include a condition that the board requests the applicant work with the tree warden to address compliance with the town's tree protection and preservation bylaw. Are there any other conditions that members of the board feel would be appropriate?
Hearing none. And what the board has finally in front of it is a, um, a request for a variance. The board has found that the uh, that the appellant has met the requirements for variance, and the board has put forward uh, four conditions: the three standard plus an additional regarding uh, compliance with the tree protection and preservation bylaw. Um, and so with that, um, unless there are any other questions from the board, uh, the chair would entertain a motion. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Hanlon, I'm not hearing you. <laughs> not on mute. For some reason, it's coming across very quietly. Hey, um, oh, here we go. All right, uh, Mr. Chairman, I move that the uh, board approve the variance in this application subject to the three standard conditions and the fourth condition regarding trees that the chair just read into the record. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Holly. Uh, so what the board has before it, this is a vote to approve a variance for 53 lands down road with uh, four conditions, the three standard plus the one in regards to tree protection. Um, so a roll call vote of the board is required. Uh, Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. Mr. LeBlanc? Aye. And the chair votes aye. The variance for 53 lands down road is approved. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Hanlon? Uh, I'd just like to reiterate my request earlier for a copy of Mr. of Ms. Center's uh, uh, slide presentation. Of course. Yep. Thank you. We thank the board. Thank you for sticking with it. <laughs> and we appreciate it. <laughs> uh, and I just to just, uh, remind the applicant that the, the vote uh, taken tonight is preliminary. There will be uh, most likely in two weeks we'll have the final the vote on the final uh, draft of the written decision at that point, the uh, 20 day appeals period would open. Perfect. And after that, it needs to be filed with the state. So thank, thank you so much for coming out. Thank you very much. Uh, great job, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. So with that, um, that brings us to docket 3781, 165 Franklin Street. Uh, so this is a, a new hearing. Uh, before the board. So if I could ask the applicants to introduce themselves and tell us what they are proposing to do. Good evening. Uh, my name is Kristen Germano and I'm the owner at 165 Franklin Street. And I'm here before the board just requesting to take our existing two family structure and expand into the rear of the 11,000 square foot lot. Um, my architect is present, Jim Riesling, and my general contractor is here with me, Greg Zelanskis. All right, thank you very much. Um, I guess I would ask uh, Mr. Riesling if he could, if I, I said ask Colleen if Mr. Riesling can have permission to share and if Mr. Riesling has drawings to share with the board. Okay, thank you. You should be all set. Okay, thank you. Still trying. <clears throat> I'm still disabled, Colleen. You wanna try again? I yep, yep. Okay, thank you. Um, so um, before you are images of the existing house at 165 Franklin, um, firstly, good evening and thank you for this time. Um, we are seeking a special permit to uh, construct or maybe reconstruct uh, the second dwelling unit at 165 Franklin Street as an attached house behind the existing house. As, as Kristen indicated, it's 11,000 square foot lot and um, 
we are seeking a special permit for the large addition uh, pursuant to section 5.4.2b number six. Um, <clears throat> the addition, are, are you still seeing my screen now? Thank you. Yes, we are. Okay. So this is the existing footprint at at 165 Franklin. Uh, oh, less the, uh, photo, the images. I'm sorry. I still haven't seen the images. Yeah. Okay. I think I'd be used to this by now. How many years into this? <laughs> there we go. Um, so this is the footprint of the existing house. Um, it also includes a large addition on the side that that um, we have um, are being allowed to remove by historic, and then an addition to the rear. So we're sort of stripping it down to its 1850s form and restoring that um, in its appearance um, with a you know more contemporary interior layout, and then um, it would be attached to uh, two separate garages, and then behind that would be another another dwelling unit, sort of replacing the up down arrangement of the two family to um, a front and back townhouse arrangement. Um, we would um, be the, the house is set back quite a ways. Um, I believe it's uh, 37 feet from the, the front property line. So we have a, a, f a very nice yard for the front unit. And then we're 32 feet off the rear property line. So another nice yard for the back unit. And then we conform to all the side setbacks for the new construction. The existing house does um, sit in the left hand setback, but we're not um, we're not increasing that in any way. And um, so we're we're conforming to all the you know the, the the zoning standards. The only thing that we need is is to be able to add the amount of addition um, that would uh, make another nice house on the lot. Um, so this is again the the layout of the front house, the attached garage, which is a one story connector, and then uh, another two and a half story addition to the rear. And then I, I do have a larger elevation. So the front elevation, this is the restored facade, um, scaling it back or taking it back to its 1850s, sort of a, a simple form uh, Greek revival. And then the back house, which is further back than this this flat drawing shows, would um, mimic that in in its its details and execution. And then this is the side elevation, um, the um, right hand side elevation. And then, um, so we were we were in the midst of maybe three or four historic hearings, and we had to quickly pivot and um, retain the rear addition of the house. So this is this is the elevation that we are now seeking um, and that should be in the, it was uploaded to the to the portal and it's included in everyone's packet, but it's, it's slightly different from the original um, submission that was done in December. Um, um, it, it's maybe turned out to be a slightly better project for that. Um, and then the, this is the rear and side elevations. Um, I do have um, I did pull up a, a PDF of the of the um, GIS map mm -hmm. to give a sense of uh, the area that this addition will will sit in. So we we are back here, and again we are um, thirty two feet off the rear property, uh, conforming to the the 10 foot setbacks. And um, we, we feel that in terms of like a figure ground study, this this is, you know, it's it's compatible with the with the neighborhood. Um, and um, I think um, yeah, I, I don't know, maybe maybe there's some other questions. I, I'm sort of running out of out of my own things to to present. Um, could you um, just speak a little bit about the, the review before the Historic Commission? 
yes, yes. Um, as I started with with um, you know this this is what we're we're starting with. Um, the, as you see, the house here in white vinyl, uh, much smaller windows. Nothing nothing very um, you know not very much evidence other than the massing of the house that it's 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 an 1850s um greek greek revival um it was it, this this is a photo of it in 1980 when it was actually um put into the um um when it was into the uh not registry but into the um I, I, i'm losing my word but but yeah. the reason it was was um, identified as it's because of its its form and it, at the time that it was identified as a historic property of interest it was it was in good shape um, a lot has happened to it since um, and so that would be our goal is to to restore some of this um, quality um, so in our back and forth we had initially sought to remove all the additions except for the main mass of the house and then um, later on, it was it was uh, determined that the the main rear L of the house was was original to it, so that we had to had to work with that as well. Thank you. If you could go back to the uh, to the site plan, sure. Let's say plan go. There we go. Actually, if you go back to the to the existing site plan, sorry. Sure. Yep. Um, so looking at the existing site plan, um, so there is an existing driveway that comes down. Uh, the side of the house and sort of yes. widens as it yep. goes down. Um, so you are removing and replacing that. Is that correct? Yes, yes. We would we would be maintaining the driveway pretty much in the same location. Um, this there's a portion of this that gets removed. Mm -hmm. This the main mass was sort of bumped out another room size. And then we would have a, a surface parking spot here, aprons into the garage, one spot here, and then and then the new house. Um so one one question that I had had when I was going through is that the, the town requires that uh driveways be no wider than 20 feet. And the proposed drawing doesn't have any dimensions in regards to the the width of the drive itself, but would just want to confirm that the driveway at its widest, which would be where it is extending to the garage, that that would not exceed 20 feet. And does that apply to, to cars making a sweep into a garage? It does. That's oh. my understanding from the my conversation with the building inspector. Okay. Okay, well, we can we can verify that. Okay. Um, you know, if it's if it exceeds 20 feet, it was merely because it was a, it, you know, it was a matter mm -hmm. of getting the car into the garage and being able to, to maneuver um, the vehicle. Okay. And then the, the also in the, the parking bylaw, it's, there's required to be a vegetated buffer between the driveway and the um, and the property line, and just because you are extending the, the drive farther to the back, um, would want to make sure that some care is taken as to the, the nature and dimensions of that buffer so that that is not, uh, wouldn't be considered an afterthought. Yeah, I believe we have, we have room to, to, you know, enhance the, the existing, definitely enhance the existing buffer that's there and, 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 you know, add, add more to it. Okay. And then it does appear here that there's a sort of a oval shaped feature with labeled patio and to the left of it. Is that a tree that's to the left of it there? Um, that that I believe uh, was a tree that has been removed. 
Was that removed recently or was that removed sometime in the past? I I don't Kristen and, and Greg, can you fill us in on that? Sure. Um I we removed that probably two months ago. We did go through the tree warden. Okay. Mm-hmm. It was it was there a particular issue with the tree itself or was it just related to the construction related to the construction mm -hmm. um so with that i would those are the initial questions that i had had um i would turn to the board for additional questions and comments Here's we have none at this time. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry, I was- Mr. DuPont. So um, we got a memo, I believe from the building department, did we not saying that this had not been characterized as a two family or that there it was not in the records as a two family? Is that correct? Uh, yes, yeah, so let me go ahead and bring that memo up. So this was, um, uh, mm -hmm. issued by the the building inspector. Let me see if I can make this a little bit bigger here. Um, so I had asked the building inspector for just a clarification of exactly what the board was required to find. Um, they responded that the property is a single family dwelling in an R2 district. Although mm -hmm. there are indications there may have been a second unit at some point in time, our office being a special services has no records of a second unit being constructed. The applicant seeking permission to build an addition that exceeds 750 square feet and is seeking a special permit under 542B, 542B6 uh, for large additions. So my question, Mr. Chairman, is just, is it currently two units that are being inhabited by two different uh, individuals or families? I would turn to uh, Ms. Germano about that. Yes, um, we purchased it um, and there were two families. Yes, two separate units. Yeah, and are I, both I, units I, occupied now? No. Okay. Right, and I, I did the um, existing conditions. There were, it was, it was set up as two dwelling units, two kitchens, you know, separate bathrooms. And it, it appears it had been for a long time. But again, a two two family is a allowed use, right? So is is that yeah. in question? No, I think it's just just confirming for the record as to okay. what the what the nature of the occupancy has been. Mr. Dupont, did you have anything further? No, I guess I'm just struggling with the question a bit because I was taken by surprise because this came into us a little late. And so, and I'm sorry, I don't have my microphone close. Um, so it came in a little bit late. And I've just been sort of wondering to myself, you know, what if any ramification is there if, in fact, it's only classified as a single family under the, you know, under the town's records? And I'm not sure that there is uh, mm -hmm. anything that would come of that, but it's something that I, I would like to be able to consider in case there is something more to it. So that's you know, maybe something for Mr. Cunningham to comment on, although I'm sure he would also only be getting this at, uh, you know, the 11th hour. But that was my concern, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you, Mr. DuPont. <clears throat> Mr. Cunningham, I don't know if you want to step in or sidestep. Maybe a little bit of both. Yeah, this, <laughs> it, it did come in late, Mr. Chair, so I'm, I'm looking at it now and I'm trying to find stuff as as the applicant speaking. So I'm, I'm doing my best to try and get up to speed on it, but it is a little difficult to do it in real time. Understandable, thank you. Um, are there other questions from the app, from the, uh, from the board? Seeing none, um, we'll go ahead and um, open the, meeting for uh, public comment. So again, um, we note that public questions and comments are taken as they relate to the matter at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing its decision. 
Members of the public will be granted time to ask questions and make comments. Members of the public who wish to speak should raise their hand using the reaction, the raise hand button on the reactions tab in the Zoom application. If you're calling in by phone, you can dial star nine to indicate you'd like to speak. Called upon by the chair, ask to give your name and address for the record. Be given time for your questions and comments. All questions to be addressed through the chair. Please remember to speak clearly. Anyone wishing to address the board a second time during any particular hearing, the chair will call upon those wishing to speak for the first time first. And once all public uh, questions and comments have been addressed or allocated time has ended, the public comment period will be closed. Um, so we are at 919. Um, so I will propose that we go to 945 uh, with public comment, unless it appears that there's a large number of people um, still in queue, at which point we can revisit that question. So with that, um, we have Ben Mangrum. Yes, can you hear me? We can, thank you. Great, thanks. And this is my son, Grady, who's next to me. <laughs> uh, so my name is Ben Mangrum and I live at 37 Hamlet Street. Uh, so my, I'm one of the abutters uh, I, uh, to the property at 165 Franklin. Um, and I purchased my home a year and a half ago and I'm uh, dismayed <laughs> at this proposal and the thought that the character of my neighborhood uh, would be so negatively affected so soon after moving to Arlington. Um, so I uh, have in front of me a, a, a brief um, uh, set of comments that I want to read. I'm I, I, I'm reading the comments as opposed to uh, just speaking extemporaneously because I'm so emotionally you know upset by this proposal. So I want to make sure that I'm staying focused um, and and reading to you the the points. Um, uh, in opposition. So, so I've actually sent a letter to the town, uh, to the zoning board outlining 11 points in opposition to the special permits. I won't read all 11 for you this evening, <laughs> uh, but I just want to highlight three. Um, so my first is simply based in the zoning bylaws. So the proposed addition is not harmonious with my property or my neighbor's homes. Um, there's no home in the vicinity that resembles the proposed alteration in size, look, or layout across the property line. Um, what else are the town bylaws for? What else is local government for if not to prevent a developer from damaging neighborhoods in this way? So the, the architect suggested that their uh, property is uh, harmonious, and I would just ask to show us which, which property is like this in the neighborhood. Um, I, I don't see any. Um, so the, the second um, uh, point that I want to raise is that the current structure at 165 Franklin Street um, at least on record, allows for two families. Um, so there's no need for an addition to allow for two families to occupy the property. Uh, so the current structure would allow for a more equitable and affordable living space. So as the architect has already said, there's uh, you know two kitchens, there's two living spaces. Um, so the space is already set up for two families. So what other justification could there be for the addition except to increase the profit of the developer? A developer's profit is not an allowable exception in the bylaws. As the member, uh, members of the zoning board previously noted, because their space is also not an allowable exception in the bylaws. So my third and final point uh, is just a personal plea to the zoning board. Um, so please deny this special permit because the changes would negatively affect my family's experience of our new home and our new neighborhood. As I've said, we moved to this area from out of state only a year and a half ago. If the proposed addition were built, I would look out our windows or my kids would be playing in our backyard and we would see this large second home, a two and a half story home structure in our backyard um, instead of the skies and trees we see right now. So I attached pictures of my current view to the letter I submitted to the zoning board so that you can see my, my current um, backyard um, and see how, imagine how it would negatively affect our experience of our home. So again, to the members of the zoning board, I ask you to imagine what it would feel like to lose such an open view of the sky and of the trees. The proposed addition would would ruin our skyline and would negatively affect the neighborhood. Um, and it's just yet another instance of how it's not harmonious with um, the properties surrounding. So for these and other reasons outlined in my longer letter, I urge the Zoning Board of Appeals to deny the special permit request and protect the character of my neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you had referenced the, the letter and the images. So I was just gonna go ahead and display those images. Um, and so this is from the, uh, the previous speaker's backyard, um, looking across the, uh, the yard that with a proposed addition and then beyond it, you can see the, the house and the garage on the property on the other side. Correct. And, and this would run 
uh, the proposed addition would run beyond the tree that you see on the rightmost side of, of the image. Okay. Um, a two and a half story, um, not the garage that's yeah. <laughs> you know, behind it. Yeah. Um, and then just a, a view slightly to the right um, of that as well. So the, the tree at the back of the property. Um, and then so here, so this, I'm assuming that this tree that's uh, in the center of the image in the, uh, in the uh, applicant's property, is that the tree that's been removed? No, no, the, no it's not. It is not, okay. They removed a, a different tree. Oh, they removed a different tree, okay. Okay, and so this, this, uh, this letter is available, it's in the, in the online record for the application. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop share. Um, and then next on the speaker's list um, is Steve Moore. Oh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Um, I am a little confused about the uh, status of the property when purchased by the applicant. Uh, I guess they are saying it was a two, a two family property. The town's record seems to call it a single family property. Uh, property in a R2 zone. Um, does that mean that this was an illegal or, or a, a non-recorded two-family? I guess I would ask uh, the applicant. Um, I purchased, purchased it um, as an R2, as a, two families lived in there. Right. When I looked it up, that's how it was listed. Oh, okay. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you. That's that. So the town had it recorded as a two-family property, not a. It is. It is listed family. with the assessor as a two-family. Okay. All right. Good. Good. That that clears one thing up for myself. Uh, secondly, I I would like to ask through you to the applicant. So, if there were discussions with the tree warden about the tree that was taken, I'm very very pleased that you approached the tree warden on on that activity. Did he tell you it was a not a protected tree? Is that why it was okay to take, or what was what was the conversation with the tree warden? Um, the location of it um, was where we could take it down, and it was not a protected tree. I would never take down a tree just to take down a tree. Um, it was smack in the middle of the location where we would be building. Unfortunately, I hate to take down any tree, um, but in this case, it was necessary. Uh, right, Mr. Chair, that, that's understandable. And I just wanted to confirm that that's what the tree warden had, had told you. Thank you for that uh, consideration. It looks, however, that uh, some other trees are on the periphery of the property. And again, it's a little hard to tell from the satellite pictures what's where. Um, I don't. Are, what are the plans relative to the trees on the surrounding edges of the property, which would be protected trees? Um, that I'll have to go over with the tree warden. Um, again, I like to keep anything I can keep. Um, I hate to take down any healthy tree. Um, if it works with the layout and they're not in the setbacks, if the trees are in the setbacks, they'll stay. If they're not, um, and it's where the dwelling's going up, that would be different. Okay, Mr. Chair, thank you. That that's That's my point is that it looks to me like the trees are in, or some of the trees anyway, are in the setback and would be protected. And the the uh, um, the assertion that they're not going to be taken if they're in the setback is uh, pleasing for me to hear because these look like some pretty large trees that, as I, I mentioned on the previous case, uh, has a large impact on uh, global warming as opposed to small trees which get replaced. So uh, thank you, Mr. That's, that's it. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Um, Next on our list, uh, Michael Said. I hope I have that pronounced correctly. Yes. Um, let me just make sure the camera. Yeah, thanks a lot. And thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak. Uh, Michael Said, I'm the homeowner of 136 Webster Street, which basically um, we are the house at the that shares the back fence uh, and, and the diagram that was shared. So um, the new construction, when it is built, it will basically um, take all this back fence or the most of it. Um, and while my garage kind of hides uh, some of the view of uh, 165 Franklin, 
from my backyard is, is completely uh, a clear view. Um, clearly, Ben has done his homework, and I echo everything that Ben have said, and I agree with that. Um, in addition, I would say um, in the in the diagram there have been a structure in the back, but that was a greenhouse that the prior tenant has used for storage, was short and small as you would expect from greenhouses. So the view, similar to Ben's picture, is open and wide, and we can clearly see the sky. And uh, the two family houses house was like far from us, which would create a privacy for both sides. Um, now with this proposed uh, uh, changes, uh, it's kind of like adding another house uh, where they were one. Uh, definitely will make it crowded, will change the scenery, will block the air and the sun. Um, it also, and I, I would like you to consider that if you approve this, you'll be creating a situation where over time, the rest of the lots that are next to these houses will end up doing the same. When these homeowners move, developers will then know I can switch a one family home or like whatever one house structure for two families or whatever and build in the back. If you have seen from the picture, the house over has just a garage where the new plans are proposing to build a garage and another house. Um, I also would like to know how many families will be there in the proposed structure, uh, how many levels um, and that will definitely alter the view and the structure. Uh, I have owned this house for eight years. I have known the prior tenant. Um, and definitely this will change the circumstances uh, around my house. And thanks a lot. Well, thank you very much. Um, next on the list uh, is John Donnelly. Yes, thank you. I appreciate the time. I'd, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about what Apologies, I need. I do need to ask your address for the record. Sorry, forty-one Hamlet Street. Sorry. Thank you so much. I'd like to talk, and I am in a butter, and I echo what uh, Michael and Ben have said already, wholeheartedly. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the house that I, I've lived here quite a while, and I've never known two families to live in that house. Um, it's a. It's always been one family, as far as I've known. And uh, prior to the person that just sold it, it was another family. And uh, I've never known two people, two families to live in that house. Um, but, you know, um, <laughs> that's, that's why what the, the, the letter that the town said interests me uh, as far as that goes. I'm, I'm very concerned about, um, and I'm looking at the, the bylaw uh, for a two family district R2. I'm very concerned that this house does not fit into the neighborhood in the least bit. Um, I'd welcome the board to walk up Franklin either way, uh, towards the center off of Hamlet, towards Parallel Street that way, and look at the lots. No lot is similar to this with this proposal. And uh, I agree with Michael that if you open the door on this one, you can, you can bet you're going to open the door on a lot coming forward. And I don't think it's correct. I don't think it's correct to build a new house in the back of this lot. Uh, it's going to take away, as, as Ben and Michael have said, it'll take away the views. It'll hurt property values uh, for those of us who've been in the neighborhood for a long time. And um, it, it really doesn't meet the residential character of the neighborhood. Um, you know, the town also states they don't want properties to consume large amounts of land. And, in, and certainly in this instance, this thing takes up almost the whole lot. So, um, you know, I, that those are my concerns. I ask that you deny the special permit. It would, it would drastically affect our neighborhood. And um, it's been a great neighborhood. People have lived here very consistently for a very long time. And this this project uh, is going to drastically alter things, both up and down Franklin Street. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, uh, next name I see is Dan Ledger. 
Hey there, uh, this is Dan Ledger. I live at 169 Franklin Street. So we are the long property that is uh, directly to the left of this property. Um, I think uh, I agree with a lot of the points that have been made here. I think, uh, you know, one other point I'd like to pick up that Michael made is that, you know, there's a wonderful corridor. These long lots create a lot of open space behind these houses. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of trees. There's, you know, they, it provides nice views. And uh, I think this, again, I agree, this creates sort of a dangerous precedent and uh, would be, you know, very disruptive to uh, this I think of the views that that a lot of people enjoy and a lot of people purchase their houses for because this is an, an area of Arlington where people have kind of these nice open wide backyards and it does create, uh, you know, you look at your windows, you see a lot of green trees. You know, I used to look at a beautiful weeping willow tree that just got cut down a couple months ago. Um, and I think we're just kind of saddened by this idea that there's going to be this giant prop, this giant new house that kind of pushes into the space. And I, I also agree that this sets a, sort of a dangerous precedent for this this area on Franklin Street where people have a little bit extra green space in the back and it, it affords a lot of folks around us kind of just a, a nicer view over the fence and a little bit more kind of view of your neighbors and a little bit more connection and things like that. So uh, that's, I, I'm sort of in alignment with, uh, with the other folks who have spoken up on this. Great, thank you so much. Um... So next is Ushwal Sharista. Hi, can you hear me? Well, we certainly can. Hi, thanks for thanks for the opportunity here. Uh, my name is Ushwal Sharista. I live on 134 Webster, right next to Michael. Um, and uh, my property is right behind the proposed development. Um, I don't want to belabor most of the points uh, that have been said. I wholeheartedly agree with what Ben and uh, Michael just said about uh, the view and the open space that we enjoy um, behind our yard right now would definitely be blocked and uh, affected in an, in, an, in an aggravated way if this construction were to happen. Um, and also wholeheartedly agree that the precedent that's, that this sets in our neighborhood uh, would not be would not be the right one. So um, I, I request that you deny this request as well. Thank you so much. Yep. Um, next is Diana Aperturnova. Aperturnova, excuse me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? We can. Great. Uh, thank you so much. So I live on 45 Hamlet Street. So it is right uh, behind uh, the property on the right side. And actually, I have the beauty of being here for 20 years. And I actually agree with John that it used to be always uh, one family property. Uh, there was always one family who lived there uh, for two decades. Uh, so I think that's... Uh, you know, one point which really needs clarification. And I really do echo uh, everyone else's uh, concerns about uh, the second large building. Uh, I think there is a, you know, picture of two garage uh, spots plus another car in the driveway. Um, you know, one tree was already cut down. Uh, I think there are multiple other trees which are around. So I think we, we worry not only just about the, big building which will which really does not fit uh, in the neighborhood but also the environmental aspect so i also echo with everyone else that uh, i i really wish uh, and vote for not uh, you guys approving uh, um, the extension thank you so much thank you um uh, council cunningham Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I think you mentioned this, but in response to Mr. DuPont's question earlier, yes, this property is listed with the town as a two-family property. Um, but I'd like to speak to uh, Mr. Champa about the memo that was received by the board this evening, a little bit more about uh, you know his research as well, uh, to come to a conclusion about what that means. But just for clarification, I think that to the point you made earlier, Mr. Chair, it is technically listed as a two-family um, property on the assessor's website with the town. Thank you. 
and as was noted previously, so this is an R2 district um, and single family, uh, two family and duplex dwellings are all allowed uses um, under the under the bylaw. So um, there is no problem changing it from single family to two family um, as far as a, a legal basis goes. Um, are there other members of the public who wish to address this hearing? Your last opportunity this evening. Seeing none, I will go ahead and close the... Oh, Ben snuck in for a second right under the bell. Go ahead. Hello, actually, this is this is Ashley Mangrum. Um, I live at the property at 37 Hamlin Street as well. And yes, I am uh, Ben's partner. Um, and I just would would want the community to hear that there are a number of children, elementary age children. Um, our youngest child is three years old and there are toddlers. There's an infant um, in a family that's already spoken. And while that might not um, sound like much to you, Surrounding this property is is more than a handful of children ages a couple of months um, up to teenage years. So actually off the top of my head, I can think of eight children. And so eight children who play in this neighborhood, in these backyards, in this community, now will be seen by the two family that lives in the two and a half um, structure, two and a half uh, structure, yeah. And so I just... I don't feel comfortable with a structure in my backyard where people can look over and see all of these neighboring backyards children playing. Um, and when our children look up to play and, and have a good time, all of us, what they see is a massive structure, literally feet from our fence line. And so I would, I would urge you to consider the experience of the children in our neighborhood, in addition to the property value and property owners and thinking about what kind of space are we creating and protecting for them in our neighborhood? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so with that, seeing no other hands raised, I'll go ahead and close the public comment period for this hearing. Um, so this returns us back to the board. So the request that is before the board, it's a special permit request for a large addition. Um, and under our bylaws, uh, it is a special permit. And so it needs to meet the special permit criteria, but it also needs to make, we need to make three additional findings, which are not uh, typical for a special permit. One is that the alteration or addition is in harmony with other structures and uses in the vicinity. The second is that consider, we need to consider the dimensions and the setback in relation to abutting structures and uses. And the third is that we need to consider conformity with the purposes of the bylaw. Um, <coughs> and that is the only uh, request for um, uh, that is being made um, for the special permit. Um, as I had mentioned to the applicant earlier, uh, there's a concern about the driveway width that under 6.1.10 a a driveway can only be 20 feet wide maximum um and then under that also under that same section that a vegetated buffer is required um between the drive of if our driveway in the side lot on the side yard setback so um those are things that the board would uh be looking to to make sure are addressed. Um, so the board has re uh, received um, uh, both from the applicant, um, the description of the, the proposed addition. Um, and we have uh, in the record, there's the letter from uh, the historic commission that this project has been reviewed and approved by the historic commission, um, which has now brought it to us and uh, as I say, the board needs to make a determination in regards to a special permit for large addition. So, uh, and at this hearing tonight, the board has heard um, from a number of uh, of residents who are abutters um, to this property with their concerns about the project. Uh, so I would uh, open up to the board uh, for their 
uh, questions and concerns um, or comments in regards to the requested application. Mr. Chair? Mr. LeBlanc? Um, I guess I would just start by arguing that I don't think the proposed addition is very harmonious with the rest of the neighborhood. Um, you know, this is, I think, a pretty unique lot in the area. Um, being this deep, looking at the, the other lots, it's, you know, they're not, not that deep. But um, the way that this is being proposed, it sort of feels like it's two structures being put on one lot. Um, yes, they're connected, but barely by a little garage. Um, and the existing structure that is there doesn't seem to hinder um, making a decent, you know, duplex type or potentially even a, a, a townhouse um, style um, renovation at that place. Um, so I, I just don't see the need for such a large addition. And also generally when we see large additions come before us, at least in my experience so far, they're not this large. They're not basically another structure. They're someone, you know, they're a family adding on to their existing house to create some more space for their growing family um, and not necessarily such a large addition. This is, I think, really, really large. Um, so yeah, I would, I would say that I don't think it meets, you know, some of the criteria of being harmonious with the rest of the neighborhood. Um, with that. Thank you, Mr. LeBlanc. I would, I would ask the the applicants, what is the proposed gross square footage of each unit? Jim, do you have that in front of you? Yes, I do. Um, each unit, the um, living space of the front unit, um, excluding the cellar, um, is 25. 123 square feet. The rear unit, excluding, excluding the cellar, is 2,790 square feet. And are the cellars of either of them being uh, built out for habitation? Uh, the, the cellar in the rear could potentially be um, finished in the future. The, the cellar in the front house does not meet um, minimum height requirements ah, for, for occupation. <clears throat> And does that include the, the garage structures or no? No, it does not include the garage. Um, the garages together come in at 548 uh, uh, square feet. Okay. Mr. Chair, thank you, Mr. I, I I joined at the at the start of this hearing, so I hope I can just ask a question. Um, I'm in. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, so, uh, just related to that square footage question, uh, the documentation that was submitted to the board was the uh, uh, proposed gross square footage of seven thousand five hundred and sixty-three. Um, uh, I would just. I just wanted to ask the applicant, Mr. Chair, if, is that is that an accurate number? I um, maybe that counts one of the sellers. It doesn't seem like that adds up to the what we just heard, Mr. Uh, uh Yes, that that is that doesn't include the garages. Um, I took that uh, the garages to be accessory parking, so. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's the two the two houses, including that's that's full on gross, except for the garages. But would that include the cellar dimensions as well? In it does. It okay. does. Okay, so that that was the that was what I was missing in the in the calculation. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, <clears throat> I think I'm inclined to agree that the, there's a problem with meeting the special provision here for harmoniousness with the neighborhood. Uh, obviously, you can't hear practically all of the butters agree with one another that 
it is har disharmonious with them uh, without at least being moved somewhat in that direction. Um, I would disagree a little bit with what Mr. LeBlanc said about building another house before. That actually, in many parts of East Arlington, as I'm sure that he knows from, because he lives here too, um, this is not an uncommon, not an uncommon thing. It, it, uh, and it's not just in East Arlington. I can remember a case that where we had a similar case on Mount Vernon Street a couple of years ago. Um, so it's not that there's anything particularly wrong with a structure where you sort of, instead of having uh, duplexes side by side, you have it front front to back. That happens. Uh, the question really in all of these large addition uh, problems is not what usually happens, but what might be true in any individual case. Um, this is not as strong a case in some ways as others. Uh, I think in some ways that the usually what you're dealing with is people building a house that involves a large mass that is actually sort of impinging on the use of the, the neighbor's property. And that's what that sort of was what uh, the bylaw was intended to to deal with, where something is is consistent with the setback requirements, but it is built in an already built out area in a way in which it interferes with people's use of their of their own property by sort of encroaching with too much mass or in some other way. Uh, the uh, uh, we've had some testimony that that's true, but to a considerable extent, the testimony is that this is this is adversely affecting people's use of their own property because they can't look into the neighbor's property which is at least a more fraught case than than the one that is typical. Um, still, doing this is essentially moving out as it, it, it is affecting an, a, a number of other uh, properties that are not currently affected on Hamilton on Hamilton Street, uh, where because of the long backyard, uh, the the impact the, is it is quite it is sort of crowding. And sort of if you step back and think about it more broadly in terms of the pattern of development in the neighborhood, often it's a good thing to put this in back and then to leave the front of the house in in, in a pretty good looking like the rest of the neighborhood. And in fact, in this case, if you thought about it that way, the front of the house is going to look better than it does now and is deliberately being restored to something that looks more like the 1850s house that has made it has made it valuable. The difficulty here is not so much from the street is that all the abutters who are who are all around it uh, are concerned about uh, a substantial increase in mat in mass and lot, lot coverage that is affecting the way they use the back of their houses. Um, and I think that the sheer unanimity of of the neighbors and the sense that this is a pretty large structure in the back, it, these units are not strange sizes in Arlington, and they are going up all over the place. But this just doesn't seem to me to be the right place for it. Um, and I don't think that this is the right street for it. Uh, Hamilton has, excuse me, Franklin does have... <laughs> I must be getting used to to the theater. Uh, Franklin does have a sort of a character of its own, and uh, I think marginally this is this is a, a difficult thing. It's particularly because of the special condition, the the special rule that we apply to large additions. Uh, if this was a straightforward special permit per and didn't have the special reg regulations, the analysis might be different. Uh, but here, the, the bylaw deliberately puts its thumb on the scale somewhat uh, in favor of, of the abutters. And, and here, I think they've made enough of a case. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Mr. Um, Mr. DuPont? So I was actually going to try to quote Mr. Hanlon uh, from the Pleasant Street case, where he essentially said the same thing about the large addition section of the bylaw. And even though I think people on the board, members of the board, could come to a different result using the analysis, I think it was persuasive when he pointed out what he just did, which is that the bylaw puts the, uh, you know, its thumb on the scale in favor of the neighbors. Because while there's no 
there's no strictly speaking right to a view or right to light. It does specifically state in this section that it has to take into account the um, the effect that it has, uh, the relation to abutting structures uh, and uses, which to me means to the neighbors. And so I believe that that is where you do have that added dimension when you're looking at this as related, as, as opposed to different uh, special permit sections that we do um, other things under. So maybe not a very articulate rendition of what Mr. Hanlon said, but I echo his findings. And I think when you look at that section two, where it says uh, in conformity uh, to the purposes of the bylaw, I go back to the section that Mr. Donnelly, one of the neighbors quoted, which was just reciting the language of 5.4.1 residential districts, uh, three sub three, which is two family districts. And I saw what he saw, which is the town discourages uses that consume large amounts of land. And I think if you look at it, and if you were to go, Mr. Chairman, I don't know if you can get this up easily, but in the Arlington inventory, one of the attachments that was in the record, it's where you have the, um, uh, the Massachusetts Cultural Resource Information System, where it has a picture of the house from, I believe, 1980. But then if you go down farther, it has the assessor's map I think that's what this is, and it circles the structure. And you can see that this lot, as well as two, which I believe are going to the north, are very sizable in the 11,000 square foot uh, range. And and so, first of all, those lots are they're they're not typical of the neighborhood, and so that I think that you have to be careful in using them and building on them because you have to take into account the character of the neighborhood and everything else around it is, you know, fairly small lots with, you know, space uh, that's limited and, you know, covered in large part by the houses. And I think that even though it's a large lot, the idea that you would put a second residence behind it is really too much massing. I mean, you're approaching 8,000 square feet um, based upon the numbers that were provided in the application. And I just don't think that that's harmonious with the neighborhood. I don't think it's really in conformity with the bylaw in the definition of the two-family district. And as Mr. Hanlon has said, you know, you have to take into account what the uh, neighbors, the abutters have to say. And I think they've been pretty uniform in their view. So I'm I'm disinclined to believe that something that large is a good idea for this particular location. Thank you. Um, so this is just the that assessor's map from back um, at the time of the initial application for the um, uh, for the historic district, uh, not for historic district, but for the historic. Um, reference. Um, if that's the image that the applicant had provided earlier as well. Mr. Chair. Yes, uh, Mr. Riccadelli. Uh, if I could just maybe echo a, a little bit of what Mr. DuPont said, you know, I think that uh, the biggest challenge for me with this proposal is the um, is just the size of, of the project. I mean, uh, several of the members of the board live in East Arlington. Uh, it's it's not very common to have a nearly eight thousand square foot house uh, in this neighborhood, uh, and I, and I you know I'm sympathetic to the neighbors um, because. Um, spaces at a premium here and uh, access to light and views and, and you know use of um, somewhat small backyards uh, like many of us have in this neighborhood is sort of like uh, sacred uh, so I am sympathetic to that so I think uh, really the size but also the, the height of that uh, addition if, if we were looking at a um, one-story addition that uh, went as far back in this lot as is proposed, 
I think we would be having a different conversation, but uh, because it is a two and a half story, you know, 32 foot tall structure, uh, I think that that sort of changes uh, the calculation uh, in terms of that large addition section of our, our zoning bylaws. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other questions or comments from the board? So seeing none, um, so what is now before the board, um, because we sort of would need to make a decision in regards to um, how we want to proceed. So uh, I think we should review the findings that would be required. Um, and then uh, at the end, the board can uh, decide whether or not the it feels the findings have been made um, as a whole. Uh, so the required findings for a special permit is under section 333. Um, that the requested use is allowed or allowed by a special permit in the district. So two family is allowed. Um, the duplex is allowed because it is a two family district. Um, and the uh, it does not require any additional um, approval for the use. Uh, the requested use is essential or desirable to public convenience and welfare. Um, so uh, two family residential use is desirable in the town of Arlington because it does allow for um, the uh, increasing the, the number of people who are able to take advantage of the town and to be residents of the town. It also um, improves the, the tax base for the town. Um, requested use will not create undue traffic congestion or impair pedestrian safety. Uh, so it is a, a duplex in a two family district, um, which would not create any undue traffic congestion or impair pedestrian safety. I would note that this uh, block, um, I actually didn't go to the end of the street. I was, I had to look down the street and thought it might be uh, blocked off at the end, but maybe it does loop around. Um, we'll ignore that. Um, but it is, uh, you are able to walk down the street um, and cut over towards uh, the Mystic River. Um, so there is some pedestrian traffic, but uh, it's not different than any other two family district. Um, that the use would not overload any public systems. So the use as a, the use as a two family would not um, overload any town or utilities uh, that would serve the property. Um, special regulations for the requested use are fulfilled. So the special regulations, that's the that 542B6 large additions, uh, which would allow the, the creation of a large addition. So we'll go and review that in a, in a minute, but I'll finish up with uh, section 333 first. Um, so the next is the requested use will not impair the character or integrity of the neighborhood. Um, so a two-family use would not impair the character and integrity of the neighborhood, but there has been a lot of um, discussion from abutting neighbors that the um, that the proposed structure would impair the character and integrity of the neighborhood. Um, uh, the requested use will not be detrimental to public health or welfare. Um, similarly, the, the use as a duplex would not be detrimental uh, to public health or welfare, but the abutters have indicated that they feel that the structure itself um, would be detrimental in terms of uh, a lack of privacy um, and uh, impacts on light and air uh, that are available towards the rear of their properties. Um, and then uh, the requested use will not cause an excess of use detrimental to the neighborhood. Um, again, the Duplexes are an allowed use. This would not create an excess of duplexes, but uh, in regards to the size of the proposed uh, structure here, um, it might, the, in the end, uh, as stated by the abutters, it could be considered uh, an excess of, um, of of structure in the in this area of the of the lot, not of the site. Uh, so those are the conditions for special permit. 
then specific to the large additions, we said before the alteration or addition is in, we have to find that the alteration or addition is in harmony with other structures and uses in the vicinity. Um, and whereas the use is certainly in harmony with other uh, uses in the vicinity, um, there has been a lot of discussion that the structure, that the addition itself is not in harmony with the other structures in the vicinity. Mm -hmm. um, that the, the location upon the lot, the depth that the structure extends into the lot, the size of the structure, the height of the structure um, are not harmonious with the, the current use pattern in the neighborhood and is not harmonious with um, the enjoyment of the, the, the abutters having enjoyment of their own property, um, abutting this property. Uh, the board needs to consider dimensions and setbacks in relation to abutting structures and uses. Um, as the as the applicant said, they do meet um, the setback requirements uh, under the bylaw, with the exception of the existing structure that has a slight nonconformity on the uh, north side of the house. Um, but the because it's going so deep into the property, it's coming close to a lot of uh, other structures that it would not necessarily um, come close to, uh, which is a little bit of an unusual circumstance in this case. Um, and the board needs to consider conformity with the purposes of the bylaw uh, to the, the purposes um, we don't often discuss during the meeting, but it might be helpful in the circumstance. Um, Uh, so the purpose of the bylaw is to promote the health, safety, convenience, morals, and welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Arlington, to lessen congestion in the streets, to conserve health, to secure safety from fire, panic, and other dangers, to provide adequate light and air, to prevent the overcrowding of land, to avoid undue concentration of population, to encourage housing for persons at all income levels, to facilitate the adequate provision of transportation, water, sewerage, schools, parks, and other public requirements to protect and preserve open space as a natural resource for the conservation of natural conditions for flora and fauna, and to serve as urban amenity for scenic and other aesthetic enjoyment and recreational use, to conserve the value of land and buildings, to encourage the most appropriate use of land throughout the town, to achieve optimum environmental quality through review and cooperation by the uses, use of incentives, bonuses, and design review, and to preserve and increase its amenities to encourage an orderly expansion of the tax base by utilization, development, and redevelopment of land. It is made with reasonable consideration to the character of the district and to its particular suitability for particular uses with a view to giving direction or effect to land development policies and proposals of the redevelopment board, including the making of Arlington a more viable and more pleasing place to live, work, and play. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Hanlon. Um, so three things, actually. One is there's a missing provision that we often we often sort of skip over because we deal with the parts without dealing the whole. When you mm -hmm. go back to Section 3.3.3, .3 before you get to the individual things that the chair just went through, um, the finding that we have to make the written determination is that the adverse effects of the proposed use will not outweigh its beneficial impacts to the town uh, or neighborhood in view of the characteristics of the site and the proposal in relationship to that site. Um, and that basically is a 3.3.3 consideration. Mm -hmm. To some extent, it overlaps. In this particular case, it overlaps with the provi provisions regarding harmony and the special regulation itself. Uh, but one of the things I think that we should recognize is that uh, some of what they've done or what they're proposing to do that has been approved by the historical commission is 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 a plus and we shouldn't the issue here is not whether this is irredeemably bad although maybe if you live right behind it that's the issue the issue really is if we're at 3.3.3 .3 is a balance and i think that we need to take if we're going to do that to take the plus side uh uh, into effect as well. I, as you know from what I've said earlier, where I actually come out on that. But in terms of the analysis, I think that we need to pay, uh, pay and, and give consideration to the standard that was set forth 
uh, in the beginning of section 3.3.3. Uh, when we get to the question of consistency with the bylaw, uh, there are so many policies that are in the bylaw and the language that the chair just read that you can almost always find that something is inconsistent in one way or consistent in another. It doesn't give you very much guidance. The only thing that we've talked about so far, uh, which I am a little bit dubious about, is what Mr. DuPont mentioned about the uh, about the use of land. Uh, I'm a little bit unclear what that was ever supposed to mean, but when you look at the GIS map here, most of the embutters have got more lot coverage than would be true here if they built the proposal that they have. So it actually, in terms of using land, um, they may not be unusually voracious, and I would be a little hesitant to rely on that uh, on that as a factor. Uh, it seems to me that that you get all the all the where you need to go in asking yourself what 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 harmonious means for purposes of the uh, special regulation relating to large additions. Um, much of the testimony has been to that, and I think that that is the place where you both have an adverse effect that outweighs beneficial impacts, uh, as well as as a failure to actually meet the the admittedly stringent requirements of uh, the large edition bylaw. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Anything further from the board? Mr. Chairman? Mr. DuPont? So I, I'm not sure uh, that this is something that the applicant wants to consider, but I think oftentimes when we've reached this point and it looks like there is a, a trend in one direction with regard to a special permit, it's it's sometimes raised as a question for the applicant as to whether or not they want to proceed with the vote and realizing that, you know, should it be uh, denied, that then they are foreclosed for a period of two years before they can come back. And sometimes applicants have chosen in the past to amend what they are putting forward with no guarantee that it will be any more acceptable to the board, but at least I think it's something that they might want to know is a possibility. So I just offer that up. I think that would be a good idea. <laughs> if we could meet back, and um, I could discuss it further with my architect, if the board would be willing to do that, if we could revisit it maybe on March 12th. Or we could, let me grab my calendar. So we could, um, we could certainly continue. Um, March 12th uh, would be, uh, that will be uh, four weeks from now, I believe it's four weeks. We're in February, yeah, so it's four weeks from now, so that would work. Um, and I, I think you've received uh, significant, um, you know, I think enough feedback already to uh, sort of the, the the sense around as to what the what the uh, issues might be. Um, and so appreciate your willingness to to come forward and to uh, to want to take a a look at uh, some additional options. Um, so I do see that uh, one member of the public has raised their hand. Um, the public comment period is closed at this point, um, but this hearing will be continued. And so when it does continue on the 12th, um, it will be available for public comment again at that time. Um, so I apologize that we um, we can't take your, your comment at this moment. Um, so then the request then that's in front of the board right now would be a request to continue. Um, where is this? So this would be a motion to continue uh, the special permit hearing for 165 Franklin Street to Tuesday, March 12th, 2024. 
at 7.30 p.m. Um, so unless there's anything further from the board, um, I would look for a motion. Mr. Chairman, so moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. And second. A second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. So this is a vote of the board to continue the special permit hearing for 165 Franklin Street to Tuesday, March 12th, 2024 at 7.30 p.m. Uh, roll call vote of the board. Mr. DuPont. Aye. Uh, Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. Mr. Riccardelli? Aye. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. Mr. LeBlanc? Aye. And the chair votes aye. We are continued on uh, 165 Franklin Street until March. Uh, thank you all very much. Um, thank you to the, to the applicant and their consultants. Thank you very much to the members of the public who uh, to stay throughout this hearing. I appreciate uh, your contributions and your, uh, your particular knowledge as it relates to uh, this particular hearing. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so this brings the board, unfortunately, back to the administrative items, which we uh, glossed over at the front and moved to the back side of the meeting. So um, go back to our official agenda. So this, now we go back to agenda item number two, which is the approval of the decision for docket 3776 49 Dixon Avenue. This was uh, written jointly by myself and Mr. Hanlon, uh, distributed to the board for comments and uh, brought forward uh, in a final version um, today. Uh, I will note that there is an additional condition in the application um, above and beyond what we had discussed at the prior hearing. Upon further review of the application, we realized um, in discussions with the with um, the inspector of buildings that the proposed deck on the Wheeler Lane side, um, where it was 10, extended 10.3 feet from the building, um, actually was an issue. And unfortunately, the way the bylaw is written, um, it, it is a, it requires a variance to make that any larger than 10 foot even. And so uh, in the building department spoke with the applicant. The applicant agreed that it would decrease the width of the port of the deck, excuse me, to 10 foot even on the Wheeler Street on the Wheeler Lane side. And so a condition was added to the um to the decision that uh, uh, essentially to paraphrase and taking into account what we have in condition number one, that what is submitted has to be built, that the deck would be 10 foot zero instead of the previously listed 10 foot three. Um, and so the that is friendly to the applicant um, and the building department is okay with it. And we have asked council and council has said that it it is okay the way we're doing it. Um, and so I just wanted to make sure that everyone is aware of that change um, in the final version of the uh, decision. So, uh, but this only applies to a certain number of us because I think there were only there were not as many people voting on this one. Uh, so, um, may I have a motion to approve the written decision? Uh, oh, sorry, are there any other questions or comments as it regards to 49? Dixon Avenue. Seeing none, can I have a motion to approve the written decision for 49 Dixon Avenue? Chairman, so moved. Thank you, Mr. Hayden. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. So a vote of those members voting on the initial uh, decision. Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. Uh, Mr. Holly? Aye. And the chair votes aye. That written decision is approved. Brings us to item three on our agenda, which is a motion to approve the written decision for 186 Overlook Road. Uh, this was an appeal of the building inspector. The decision was written by Mr. Hanlon, distributed to the board for questions and comments and final version posted this afternoon. Are there any additional questions or comments in regards to the written decision for 186 Overlook Road? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion. Chairman. Move that, move that the board approve the written decision in uh, uh, docket 3783, 186 Overlook Road. Okay. Uh, was that Mr. DuPont for a second? Yes. Yep. Thank you. Uh, vote of those present at the initial hearing, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. And the chair votes aye. That uh, decision is approved. That brings us to 
item number four, which is the approval of the meeting minutes from November 28th, 2023. Uh, these were distributed by um, Ms. Ralston to all of us um, a couple of weeks back. Um, I have submitted a couple of comments on them. I don't uh, know particularly if other people have comments. Is it, Did anyone else have any additional comments they wanted to provide in regards to the minutes for November 29th? Mr. Chairman? Mr. Hanlon? Just want to indicate that that I fell short of my standards of reviewing these things because I hadn't realized we were going to be doing them tonight. So I'm not going to be either making motions or voting on these 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 sets. Understood. Um, I will cross you off. Okay. Um. So with that, can I have, unless there's further comment, can I have a motion to approve the minutes from the November 29, 2023 meeting? Mr. Chairman, so moved. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. And a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Holly. So vote to approve the minutes from November 29, 2023. Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. Mr. Rigadelli? Aye. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. Mr. LeBlanc? Aye. The chair votes aye. Those minutes are approved. That brings us to item five on our agenda, which is approval of the minutes from the December 12th meeting. This is possibly the shortest meeting we have ever held. Um, the minutes are about two thirds of a page. Um, unless there's any additional questions or comments, I would take a motion to approve the minutes from December 12, 2023. Mr. Chairman, so moved. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. And a second. Second. Thank you, Mr. Holly. Uh, vote of the board, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. Mr. Riccadelli? Aye. Mr. LeBlanc? Aye. And the chair votes aye. That is approved. Brings us to item six on our agenda, the approval of the meeting minutes from January 9th, 2024. Um, the, these, again, uh, prepared by Ms. Ralston, submitted to the board for uh, comments. Are there any additional comments in regards to the meeting minutes from January 9th? Seeing none, I will entertain a motion to approve the minutes from January 9th, 2024. Mr. Chairman, so moved. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Uh, can I have a second? I need a second from Ms. Hoffman. Second. Thank you. Uh, so vote of the remaining members of the board who are present, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. And the chair votes aye. That bit set of minutes is approved. All right. And that brings us to the end of all the items on our agenda this evening. Um, so briefly, we have a meeting scheduled for uh, February 27th. Uh, there are three new items on our agenda, and there are no continued items. So there are three items for that. Um, and then Tuesday, March 12th, uh, we just put two items on as continuances. Um, and Colleen, I don't know if there are any other items for March 12th. Doesn't matter. Um, uh, sorry, Christian. Yep. I thought I was unmuting myself. I was not. Um, <laughs> no, as of now, that's it. The three, okay. the three new ones, and then the two continuous. Perfect. Yeah. Um, and then that. So that's uh, February twenty seventh to March twelfth. Unless there's any other questions, um, I will go ahead and conclude the meeting. Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Just real quick, while I have everyone. Um, the issue that I brought up with you about the uh, abutting property that's being renovated, that looks yeah. like that's not going to be an issue. Oh, great. Um, I was just looking up the, the building permit has been issued um, and with, you know, um, with a condition that it, uh, the, the issue was that they wanted to add a second driveway. Mm. So that the uh, building department is not allowing them to do the second driveway as a condition of it. So oh, okay, a special permit. Sounds good. Thanks so much. Appreciate that. 
Well, I would like to thank you all for your participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting. I'd especially like to thank Colleen Ralston and Mike Cunningham for their assistance in preparing for and hosting this online meeting. Please note the purpose of the board's recording the meeting is to ensure the creation of an accurate record of the proceedings. It's our understanding the recording made by ACMI will be available on demand at acmi.tv within the coming days. And if anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to zba at town.arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the Zoning Board of Appeals website. And to conclude tonight's meeting, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. So move to Mr. Chairman. Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Vote of the board to adjourn. Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. Mr. Riccadelli. Aye. Ms. Hoffman. Aye. Mr. LeBlanc. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Thank you all very much. A lot of work tonight. Good job getting through it all and look forward to seeing you in two weeks. Good night, everyone. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thanks, everybody.